Sorry, I uh, didn't follow your lead as well as I should have done the exec yesterday. Oh, sorry. So no I, I was like, oh yeah, I see why he's doing that. <laughs> I'm going to have Ryan do the meeting when he shows up. He had, uh, something else going on at 10. I forget off the top of my head what it was. Good afternoon, everyone. So, this is our Wednesday, July 12th, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting. Welcome, everyone. He's more informed. Than, uh, John P. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. We're here today. <laughs> we, any additions or deletions to today's agenda? There are no additions or deletions to today's Perfect. agenda. Yeah. Thank you. Public comments. Anybody wish to make a public comment? You're welcome to do so. You just need to come forward, identify yourself. Please limit your comments to about three minutes. Um, my name is Brad Osborne, and I'm just here to. Um, um, represent um, a program that we started up here between Aspen and Parachute to support um, our current military and veterans and their families called FOCUS and it's an evidence-based curriculum of resiliency training that's been used by the military for about 18 years now that we received a block grant from the Office of Behavioral Health for and I got hired about two and a half three months ago to facilitate the programming so I'm I'm on the road and trying to get the word out there to everybody. So I'm, I'm reaching out to um, the commissioners and town councils and so forth in our community. And, um, and so I just really want to just take a minute, uh, introduce the program. Um, the best thing about it, with the support of the Office of Behavioral Health, there's no cost to the individuals and their families. Uh, we're in, we have three years left on this grant, so it's a pretty stable program that we can offer. Um, we're, we're offering the program out of both Glenwood Springs and Basalt, but we're also able to go to them. So if they're up here for some reason can't get down to Basalt or Glenwood, we can come up here and meet with them. And, and I had a chance to finally connect with uh, Pitkin Veteran Service Officer Janine. She's awesome. She's great. And uh, so we're um, going to meet next week and try to figure out a way, uh, maybe over in the Health and Human Services building, where I can access space as needed or something. But um, I don't. I really don't want to take up too much time. I brought some flyers and brochures. If I could leave them for you, my hope is really all I'm really asking. I think is that if you would just kind of you know, maybe use the trickle down effect. I just wanted to start with you folks and if you can just maybe pass the word or if you anybody come reaches out to you about a issue with veterans or something, aim them our way and we'll do our best to support them. Um, beyond the curriculum, you know, we have um, Shelly Evans and I both, who is the director of community health initiatives. We both have a lot of experience with families and trauma and substance use so we can really support them beyond the curriculum it's not like we're going to open up this can of worms with these families and not be able to support them going forward so um, I'm open to any questions if you have any questions for me or anything but that's really what I wanted to do uh, Steve um, is your contact information on the on the yes, sheet there and have you spoken with Colonel Merritt about this I haven't had to yet, but he is on my list of people to contact. I just haven't gotten to him yet. I'd really just turn the um, the networking switch on July 1st, mm -hmm. and I've okay. spent about two months um, getting used to the curriculum, transitioning from my old project, my old job that I was working on, and so I will contact him. There's actually a couple of really um, active uh, veterans and so forth up here in Pickin County that are, I think that I'm really looking forward to connecting with them. Absolutely. Good. Well, thank, thank you very thanks much. Thanks for being Brad. We appreciate it. Yeah, if you just want to hand that to Jeanette, she can make sure the information. The brochures hand yeah, them over she there. She can make sure that we that we get it. Great. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Nice to okay. see you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Anybody else wishing to make a public comment? Appreciate it. Uh, just come. You'll need to. You'll, you, you have you'll to need come to come forward to the mic. Sorry about that. So I just want to make a public comment about something that's on the agenda, so I can talk about it when it hits the agenda. Is it on? A, is it for a public hearing agenda item? It is a land use item. Uh, land use, which will be public hearing. Yeah. So if you could hold off. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to make a public comment? Seeing none, we'll close the public comment and bring it back for commissioner comments. 
Patty? Um, yes. Um, we've had a rough couple of weeks here in the Valley with loss of many, many special people to us. So I just want to bring their names to the attention of the public. I don't have a lot of information about planned services at this time, but we lost one of our really good friends, Richie Cohen. And then we had the saddened loss of Penny Ritchie. And then we had Froggy Scott Blair Whitlock, who um, was killed tragically um, last Thursday night. His service will be on Saturday, this Saturday, at 1030 at Island Park. Um, it should be well attended, so please plan to come early and either ride the bus or ride your bike. Um, and then we had the, the sudden death of Guido Meyer Jr., which just happened over this weekend. So we, we were hit hard this week. So I want everybody to keep the, you know, the family and their friends and their thoughts and prayers, um, and hopefully we'll be able to attend the services as uh, more information comes out. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Uh, Greg? Right. Yeah, I want to reiterate what I said yesterday. Um, last week we had the opening of the water park in Basalt, uh, which was a success story uh, for the Healthy Rivers and Streams Board and for the county in, in uh, preserving a water right, creating a water right, and, and hopefully preserving water in our, in our rivers, which is so important. And I wanted to, uh, John Ely was here, he snuck out, but I want to recognize John for his hard work on that over the years. Rachel Richards, who instigated it. <laughs> and you, you mentioned that it just lost the other. Uh, Roseanne Sullivan. Roseanne Sullivan also had such right. a big role in this years ago. And all the commissioners played a role, Healthy Rivers and Streams, for a decade or more. So we joked about it being the shortest river trip we ever did <laughs> when we ran the rapid the other day. But in fact, it, the preparation for that uh, expedition took 10 years or more. And it was worth it. You so. also should add, though, the people on the, the bank were saying, flip them, flip right. them, <laughs> hoping that the commissioners that are all action. in one raft would get flipped. Okay. But we all held, hung in there. It was really fun, Greg. Thanks anyway, for bringing I it up. I wanted to single out Rachel because I know she was behind this at the very beginning. And she did a lot yeah. of work. And I'd like to single out all the taxpayers who, who saw the need as we saw it and supported uh, creation of the Healthy Rivers and Stream Fund. Great. Thank you. Steve? <clears throat> Uh, yesterday, I got to go on a ride down memory lane. The raft bus is rerouted through basalt going down the Two Rivers Road past the 7-Eleven, and the bus stop was right there at the 7-Eleven like it used to be in the old days. And I don't know the reason, but I presume that they are rearranging the, by the, the pedestrian underpass? underpass and getting the old the raft of stops there back into operation. So that's good news. Good. Can I add one more little thing? Certainly. <laughs> uh, I just want people to be aware there was an article in the paper today about bears. Um, I have firsthand experience that the bears are hungry and they're out because one was in my kitchen this morning at 2 a.m. or trying to get into my kitchen. Thank God I have very small kitchen windows and it must have been a really big bear <laughs> because all he was able to do was open my window, reach in, and clear off my kitchen counter. And I think the fact that my clean dishes hit the floor, none of them broke, scared him off. But it's kind of a rude awakening. So please be careful and please, you know, pay attention with your trash, your food, you know, opportunities, um, and keeping your doors and windows secure at night, even though it's been hot. So I wanted to let people know that it really is happening. Okay. Uh, nothing today. Okay. Uh, speaking of trash, uh, <laughs> we talked about, uh, I think John Peacock mentioned this a, a week ago or so, that our landfill... Uh, our airspace is filling up uh, quicker than we would like to see due to a lot of the uh, demolition and construction going on. Uh, when I got off the raft of bus and I went onto my Wii cycle to get here, um, I, I rode by the, uh, the Lenado Hotel, the old Hotel Lenado. And um, so they're tearing that down. It's, it's sort of like an implosion with a with a uh, big front end loader. Uh, but it's really a shame because uh, when I looked at the roofing was in perfect shape, and they were tearing that down. The siding was in perfect shape. The windows were great, and yet they're just demolishing that. And um, of course, it's within a city. But I just wonder if there's a way that we can help incentivize uh, contractors with a carrot and a stick. Uh, to uh, deconstruct before they demolish uh, all these materials that are going to end up in a landfill taking up valuable airspace, materials that could certainly be reused, recycled again. So I'm not sure how, if we can address that from a landfill 
uh, fee point of view or work with the city because it's just a shame to see these materials just being demolished and then ending up taking up our airspace. So these are strategies that our staff has already been in discussions with uh, with City of Aspen and become um, probably part a, a discussion about our codes um, a, as well as you know how how we manage landfill and just on on another note we I had mentioned to George during one of our weekly updates we're hitting uh, record months right now at the the landfill and so uh, the landfill is in the process of doing a detailed airspace study and we'll be bringing that back to you uh, early fall so that we get a uh, a new estimate and read on, on where we're at with the volumes that are coming through. But with that, there is a lot of work um, going on right now to address exactly the kinds of, of questions that you're talking about, George, and it's going to take cooperation um, with our municipal partners and between departments to uh, really address uh, more reuse issues. All that said, we are very successful as a landfill in, in diverting materials um, from being buried to, to being reused. Brian, correct me, I think our diversion rate is at about 42% right now, a little higher than, than that. So um, we, we are doing a lot as a community, but to your point, George, there's probably more we can do. So we are exploring those options, and I imagine those will be policy discussions coming back to you guys in the near future. Yeah, great. So, George, if I run over right now, I think I can get a new window for my kitchen. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> get a ladder. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks for uh, following up on that. All right. So with that, we're going to move on to our consent uh, items. Uh, the first is a single reading. This is a ratification of hearing officers' determination on abatement petitions. Uh, that would be Jeanette and perhaps Larry. Hi, Jeanette Jones, Deputy County Clerk to the Board of County Commissioners. What we have before you today is uh, a three or four abatement petitions that a hearing officer um, heard on, I think, can't remember the date it's in your packet but they're before you today for ratification of the as the Board of County Commissioners not the BOE we have the BOE going on now too so we will be bringing some of those forward to you but these are abatement petitions to be approved by the Board of County Commissioners excuse me and Larry is here if you have any questions for him so I think there's only three three okay. just want to make sure I didn't miss one <laughs> Any questions for staff? No. I would accept the motion to approve. I'll move to approve the ratification of the hearing officer's determinations on the three abatement petitions. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Yes, Steve, I'm sorry. Um, I'd just like to make a comment that I, I read through all three of the applications and um, it actually was, you know, some kind of complex questions to be answered but I having read it all I would concur with uh, the determination that was made on all three of those all right well we'll see if that vote holds up then <laughs> all in favor say aye aye, aye. 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 great thank you. thank you thank you next we're going to this is first reading set for public hearing on July 26. It's an ordinance authorizing the lease and agreement between Jedediah's Holdings LLC and the Aspen Picking County Airport. Come on and take a seat. <laughs> <laughs> Got you on the other side of the table. <laughs> oh, you. Oh, I've got a PowerPoint here. Just pull this guy out. Uh, 
Good afternoon, my name is Chris Padilla. I'm the airport controller at the Aspen Ping County Airport. Um, and before I start, I just want to make I just want to make a clarification on the agenda item summary. Uh, the next item next action item uh, was set accidentally on March I think 26th on the item summary. It should be July. So just as a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> we had a long way to go for that. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that when I was reading it. I was like, okay, that's gotta be addressed. <laughs> so uh, today I will be presenting the lease uh, between Ashton Pinton County Airport and Jedediah Holdings. Uh, first thing we'll be doing is talking about the concession opportunities that were uh, sent out for RFP, the lease program, the process and overview of it, and the next action items for the BOCC. Uh, the concession opportunities that we put out were for the main restaurant, the bar, uh, food delivery service system uh, via mobile app ordering grab and go coffee grab and go coffee bar catering services uh, for the food and beverage um, and the, for the retail emphasis we have local artist products aspen souvenirs sundries and health products that uh, we will be offering so the airport had went through an rfp process uh, for the food and beverage and the retail side of uh, concessions at the airport. Uh, the current or the previous tenant uh, business model just did not match with the airport size and they chose not to bid. Uh, we went out for RFP, went through the process and selected Jedediah Holdings LLC as the, uh, uh, the, concessionaire, the concessionaire. The lease parameters are from August 1st to July 22nd, or August 1st, 2017 to July 2022. Uh, this also has two additional years for renewal, um, a contingent upon both parties' agreement. For the fees, we have a minimum annual guarantee. For the food and beverage side, that's $52,000 a year. And on the retail side, that's $44,200 a year. We also have a escalation on the MEG or the minimum annual guarantee based on the revenues. And we also have a revenue sharing uh, platform. The revenue sharing scenarios in the food and beverage are the MEG of 52,000 a year. Uh, monthly, we will be expecting $4,333 a month. On the revenue sharing, the threshold doesn't really kick in for the tiered structure that you see below until uh, gross revenue sales of $577,000. On the retail side, you can see that monthly we're expecting $3,600 a month. On the revenue sharing side, the new tiered structure does not kick in until uh, gross sales uh, kick in at $401,000. And then today with me, uh, to answer any questions or concerns, I have, I'm pleased to announce uh, Mike Grew here, and if there's any questions or comments. Oh, thank you, and welcome again, Mike. We, we did have a, a very good work session uh, with the staff and with Mike uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, one of the uh, opportunities that you were talking about, Mike, was to see how you would be able to provide some food and beverage in the non-security areas now that the main restaurant is in the security areas. How, have you been able to, to figure out a way to do that? or? Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission. Um, Mike Garou for Jedediah Corporation. Jedediah is Holdings LLC. In this particular case, Jedediah is Aspen. Um, yes, <clears throat> we've, been working, well, we've been working on a couple of different ideas. And the main, you know, right now our main focus is getting open, you know, on the uh, – on what we call the air side and uh and shooting for that august 1st opening um and to do that we've received an, a tremendous amount of help uh, not only from the airport staff but from your from your clerk's office with regards to liquor licensing from the planning office with regards to permitting we're in a we're in a full permitting process right now to make some small changes and so that's been our primary focus right now is to get that to get that package together to move towards that August 1st opening. Because as you know, currently, the offerings at the airport for our guests are, is very minimal. And we want to get that 
we want to get that up to speed. We have hired a manager. We hired a local, a local, um, a local lady here that we're very excited about, named Rachel, and I can't remember her last name right off the top of my head. But she's she's in Jackson right now as we speak. We flew her up to Jackson as of yesterday, and she, as of this morning, is in full training mode at our at our Jackson at our Jackson store just to kind of see the basics of what we do and to get her ready to be back. Um, our team will be on the ground here after the 22nd of, of this month to, uh, um, to, go into full, to go into full mode. So we'll have a team here for the next, for the next 30 days um, just working on getting open, hiring, and getting all that together. Now, towards your question about the air the uh, land side one of the ideas that we've discussed and we haven't really totally fleshed this out is to um you know a lot of the flights especially um you know in the winter time come in at all different hours some of them are delayed some of them come in later on in the evening and so we were kind of toying around with was besides the usual you know coffee cold drinks things to people to grab while they're waiting for their luggage or the folks that are waiting to pick them up or waiting for them there's no need to offer some small packaged items so people can take back to their condo for example like a uh, cheese and cracker tray or a breakfast tray with uh, fruits and bagels and things so people that are getting in late may not have an opportunity to stop at a local grocery store or or somewhere else that they're just going off to their room they're tired they've been traveling all day to be able to pick something up to take with them for that next just that next little something meal and so those types of things you know maybe to grab a to grab a, um, a, a, an item of you know whether it's gloves or just a, you know just some clothing items that maybe they forgot or something they, they walk off the plane and it's a little colder than they anticipated that maybe some extra little fleece item or something they can grab those types of things that kind of just oh my gosh I need this or we're going to need this or the kids are going to need something to eat when they first get to the room and it's late and so there might not be as many opportunities for them so things of that nature are what we anticipate for that area great thank you great uh, any idea. other questions no that's a great idea steve um thank you um the thought occurred to me that you might be bringing some products from jackson or missoula to the aspen airport for sale and that you might be bringing some local Aspen items for sale at those airports. Uh, <laughs> have you thought about that at all? About the mer merchandise that you're going to be selling? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, uh, we do. It's one of the things that, uh, as we learned when we uh, opened in Missoula, um, there were there were a number of Montana products that you know, we've imported back down to Jackson, the Jackson store, and vice versa. And we anticipate doing the same thing. And it's not just items; it's a uh, it's a uh, it's people power as well. Um, our our manager in our in our uh, Missoula unit comes from a corporate world of restaurants that, frankly, I'm very limited in knowledge of about corporate structure and as our little company gets bigger he's actually helping us with things like inventory and 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 how and ordering just some little tricks of the trade that he brought that he brings um, that he's actually helping us with in, in our Jackson unit now and he'll be here during this during this opening period to help set up um, set us up in Aspen and so not only so and, and we anticipate Rachel uh, has a really strong personal service background and so we anticipate her helping out our folks in Montana taking some Aspen ideas about about serving the public and some ideas that she has to take them up to Missoula and take them to Jackson and so it's not just items um, but there they will be too whether it's uh, I think you probably see Woody Creek vodka in uh, in the Jackson Airport in Missoula and you might see some you might see some uh, uh, Montana products or some Wyoming whiskey down this way so those types of things and other and other items that uh, move back and forth all purchased legally through the <laughs> proper commissions and proper authorities as we've been fully vetted and explained by your <laughs> illustrious deputy clerk <laughs> who's, <laughs> who's, who has walked us has walked us through and helped us more than she'll ever know and uh in helping us uh, work through the thicket of uh of a uh, liquor license law greg hey, mike i understand you you also supply meals for uh, private 
Aviation. Is that right? Up in, uh, in Jackson or in Missoula? Or was that part of your Mr. operation? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, yes, we do in both locations. Uh, we do, uh, well, we actually do all virtually all the catering in Jackson and in Missoula as well. Our nine, the only catering we don't do in Jackson are folks that have their own that have their own chefs um, for their for their for their private jet. We have contractual arrangements with uh, NetJets with Air Culinaire, although Air Culinaire has their own kitchen here. So we anticipate that uh, we know it's a large market here. We know it's also a market that's very well served here. Um, we've talked with our with our partners um, at, at those various companies, and the way we see it, it'll be an evolving role. We'll be, you know, starting in. We'll just be someone that if someone needs something, we'll be here to uh, to provide that. And as it as it goes, we hope that that'll expand as well. But right now, our main focus is inside that is inside that inside the air side of the terminal itself at the airport. Right. The, the the reason I brought it up is I was just thinking if you're if you're used to preparing those go packages maybe that's something that can happen on the land side and uh, the people getting off the commercial aviation here might get the sense that they've got that special uh, you know ability to pick up something special on their way out way through mr. chairman commissioner that's exactly what we're that is those exact items that we it's a comes on it comes in nice and nice plastic just like we wrap for for the private jet it's wrapped it's 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 sealed and it's you know it's like whether it's Rating bagel it. locks and bagels and cream cheese or cheese and crackers or whatever they, yeah, the same type of that they would be available for folks just to pick up out of a refrigerated case and take with them to their to their condo their hotel put them in the fridge and and have them there that's exactly what we're anticipating doing so that type of thing and those types of things are the types of things that you'll also see inside the grab and go area inside the airport for folks to take on the plane itself and it's that kind of level of quality and service that's what people that we think are looking for and so that's what we intend to provide thank you Good, thanks Rachel yeah I just want to say um, I uh, really am glad that you bid for this uh, I'm happy with the win um, I think that you know someone who is very familiar with ebbs and flows of resort tourism traffic and you know, how you can have a very dead restaurant for uh, certain periods of time and then need to be just full bore uh, at other periods of time, uh, that you understand the seasonality and then, again, the kind of uh, mountain resort guest uh, clientele. I think these things will be very helpful um, moving forward and having a successful restaurant dining experience in the airport. So I wish you well with this, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it all goes. Well, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, thank you. And... It is um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we're very excited about it, and we're, ex we're excited to be here. Um, the, uh, we are incumbently aware of the seasonal nature of uh, working in a resort community. And as I think I mentioned last time, there were a number, at least I was only aware through the process of the final, the final applicants. Um, but I know they were all excellent quality operations and I think the only the only difference that we brought to the table was the very experience that you talked about and the experience inside an airport with the security arrangements that are needed which is a huge aspect of this that is if you, if you don't know uh, I, I like I say I always invite people just like just come and watch what it takes us to do to empty the garbage or to <laughs> or to do the recycling um, in, inside a secure area it's it's a different it's a different world and we're fairly well versed in it and so and we're prepared to do it and we're excited to do it and we're excited to be here and we appreciate it very much thank you one last short one so okay one last quick question regarding the mobile app are you going to pursue that is that because uh, i'm thinking that mobile app could work for anybody in the valley if they want to pick something up on their way up or down valley that's an an option i don't know if you if you can consider that or not Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner, yes, it will be. It will. We will have it up and running, um, not by not by opening on August, but by this winter. I anticipate that that'll be open. Um, also, I think I showed you some or demonstrated for some of you uh, the newspaper capabilities that we have online. Well, that we'll, that we'll have our own Wi-Fi in the airport. Or work with the airport yeah, has yet to be determined. Working with the airports, either way. But while you're inside the airport, we we'll plan to have that you and any customer that walks in will be able to access 
hundreds of newspapers, hundreds of magazines, all at no cost while you're there, and also be able to order food on our app and while, while you're waiting in line to check in and have it available for you inside when you arrive, or as you suggest, to order it and have it delivered outside to our outside, to our landside location. So if you're just driving by or if you're waiting for someone and their flight gets delayed and you want to order something more than just a, a sandwich, or if you want to order hot food that we'll be able to deliver to you as well out in the, out in the terminal. Great, thanks. Okay, Steve. Ready for a motion, please. I move to approve an ordinance authorizing the lease and agreement between Jedediah Holdings LLC and the Aspen Picking County Airport, uh, set for second reading and public hearing on July 26th. I will second. Any further discussion? See none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, and nice Thank to you. see you again. Thank, Thank you, you very Mr. much, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we're going to move on to our public hearing. Uh, these are all second readings. The first is an ordinance approving the amendment to the Ruby Subdivision Conservation Easement. I'm Paul Holsinger. I'm the Agriculture and Conservation Easement Administrator for the Open Space and Trails Department. Um, and uh, to give you a little reference here, the uh, Ruby Conservation Easement was granted to the county back in 2000. And uh, the easement was granted as part of a subdivision um, uh, agreement. And uh, the landowners agreed to grant a conservation easement to the county on the areas that they owned that were within the Hunter Creek floodplain, as well as the areas that they owned above the Salvation Ditch. And the property you can see on the map here is, is right along, I can't see the cursor, but uh, the property, the conservation easement area is outlined in yellow. Uh, a good portion of it is, uh, is within the uh, the Hunter Creek Trail extension runs uh, right alongside the property. Um, uh, about uh, three or four months ago, the property owners uh, approached us because they were doing some work to develop the, the area that is not within the conservation area. There was a water line that they were looking to improve and tap into, and they were working with the city to do this. Uh, they originally had attached a plat uh, or reference to plat within their conservation easement. And uh, uh, when they got to work, they found out that that water line isn't in the place that was actually platted. So to avoid violating this conservation easement, we needed to, we need to amend this conservation easement to allow them to um, improve and maintain those uh, amenities that were existing at the time this conservation easement was granted. So uh, this water line has been there since before this easement was granted. So we're just uh, hoping to amend the conservation easement to add language saying that they are allowed to uh, maintain and improve those uh, utilities that are already existing at the time of this conservation easement. Great, right, thanks, Paul. Uh, any questions for Paul and Patty? No changes from first reading? No changes. Perfect. I'd like to make, oh, this is a public hearing. Yeah. Right. Any, any other uh, questions for Paul at this point? Anybody wishing to comment on this? Seeing none, I'll keep the public hearing open for the next couple of items as well. I will make a motion to approve. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, Thanks Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Next is a resolution providing supplemental appropriations to the 2017 budget for the second quarter. I'm Connie Baker, Pickin County Budget Director, and here to present the resolution for supplemental appropriations to the 2017 budget for the second quarter. Uh, we do have one change in this resolution from first reading. And that is a change to the buttermilk parking management plan. And so Brian Pettit is here to talk about that change uh, as I scroll down to the supplemental request. 
I will describe the change. I'm Brian Pettit, I'm the Public Works Director. Uh, I estimated that the capital setup would be $10,000 for buttermilk. I woefully underestimated the cost of plastic barricades. And so uh, the expense that for capital improvement to buttermilk to get it prepared for this new endeavor is more expensive. I do not think $30,000 will be reached. In fact, just in the last couple days, because City Council approved it on Monday, we've gotten better estimates on the barricades, the signs that are going to be required, and the concrete that's needed to support the, uh, the ticketing booths. Um, I think we're in more in the line of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for that capital improvement. I don't think it changes our, our recommendation to get this done. I uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we've had more and more calls for people wanting to utilize buttermilk lot for the purposes outlined in our management plan. I think it's money well spent, and even if it was thirty thousand uh, dollars. It would be a good thing to do. I don't think we'll come close to that. I just wanted to make sure we'd covered uh, that capital expense finally and once and for all. All right, questions, Patty? So, so Brian, let me clarify, too, on these plastic, orange plastic jersey barriers, right? Uh, They're they, water-filled? They, they are, and they'll be blue. Oh, they'll so be blue. They'll be blue. Uh, they are water-filled. Uh, they will be removed in the fall and placed in the spring. And I'm hoping that uh, buttermilk could actually use them, too. Maybe there are some synergies that we can have with uh, buttermilk management. Well, that's what I was going to say. Or if in the future, and we found we didn't need them there or whatever, we could always recycle them and use them elsewhere because they are more transportable than a cement jersey barrier. Absolutely. I think it's a great use of the money. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Brian. Thank you. Any other questions on that additional supplemental? If not, okay. back to you, Connie. So with that change, uh, it is a change of an additional $20,000. Uh, and with that, this uh, budget resolution will increase the 2017 expenditure budget of the county as a whole uh, by $533,000. <coughs> that is offset by an increase in $135,000 to the revenue budget for a net cost of $398,000. Uh, we have gone through these different requests. There are 10 requests in total. Uh, two are for full-time ongoing positions. The first of those is a finance analyst in the finance department, which replaces Debbie Nelson's position. Um, it was set to sunset that position, but this request would have it as an ongoing position. And then also a finance specialist shared by Human Services and Public Health. There's also a, a request for a summer engineering intern in Public Works. Uh, funding for the buttermilk parking management plan, which Brian just spoke about, a scanning project for community development, a project to refurbish the Health and Human Services data closet, uh, appropriating a $100,000 GOCO grant in the Open Space and Trails Fund, an addition of $90,000 to the budget for the airport fuel tank replacement, library blackout curtains and benches, and then a carry forward of funds from 2016 in the Healthy Community Fund for the Aspen Family Connections Program. Um, are there any of these program areas that the board has questions on of, about the supplemental request or would like to go into more depth on? Patty? I have a question, and it's kind of more for John Peacock, having to do with um, increases in staff numbers in general, not really specific to this budget request. Um, in light of recent editorials in the local newspapers, et cetera, about the impending doom of another recession, I would like us in the future to just keep track on a either by you know annual basis or annual basis of what we're increasing our staff numbers by. I, I think the hardest thing for me with my previous terms on this board was when we had to let people go. That was devastatingly brutal, and I would like us to Keep, in, keep that in mind when we just keep adding staff, you know, for permanent positions full-time year-round, just so we have some idea at the end of the day what we're really doing to the greater picture. I think that's really important. And, and Patty, we have that report that we can give to you. We, we present that annually with the budget where we have, I, I believe it's a five-year uh, run on all of our right. FTE changes by department so that you can see those. 
it obviously doesn't tell the whole story because a lot of what's driven the FTE requests and, and increase in numbers in recent years uh, is twofold. Uh, one is we've been converting a lot of functions that we've previously contracted right. out um, to bringing some of those functions in-house. And so while it may not have created actually a net increase uh, in, in expenditures, it um, did create a net increase in, in people. But you're right, and that's going to be a theme uh, for us as we go into this next year's budget is we have gone through seven years of pretty sustained growth. Um, it's always hard to tell when that correction is right. going to come. We'd all have yachts in the Mediterranean <laughs> if we could really predict it. Um, but history would tell us that, that we, we need to be cautious uh, going in, and so we are paying attention and to just that. And just to keep our heads up on it, I think, mm -hmm. is important. But other than that, I think the request before us today is totally sustainable. Yes. As John mentioned, uh, the request for the finance specialists shared by Human Services and Public Health really is a result of taking services that we contracted out for previously and now have brought in-house. Uh, we had a contract with Eagle County for a number of years to provide economic assistance programs, and that was brought in-house. That created more pressure in human services. Public health, a number of functions were outsourced previously, now 2017 being the first year of bringing that actually in-house with a county public health fund. Right, we're going to see a lot of that. That's good for clarification, so the public knows. I think it's important. Other questions? I'll this is a public hearing. Anybody wishing to make a comment on this? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move it back to the board. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thanks, County. Thanks, Thank Brian. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last is an ordinance accepting the second amendment to the Vested Property Rights Agreement, CDPUD Plan Development Agreement, Historic Covenant and Agricultural Building Covenant for Deadwood Ranch. We don't have staff here for this? Oh, yeah, she's right yeah, there yeah. in front of me. I'm like, where is she? Where did she come from? <laughs> she snuck in there. Suzanne Wolf for Community Development. Um, I think pretty much George, the title may say more than, more than I need to say, um, since that's pretty thorough. This is second reading for acceptance of the document that George just read the full title of. Um, this is the second amendment um, for the Deadwood Ranch. Um, this ties back to an approval that was just granted um, last year in 2016 that made changes to the Conservation Development PUD for the Deadwood Ranch, um, which merged properties, rezoned, um, did some shifting around of their CDPUD approvals, um, and this is a final step towards final recordation of documents associated with that in order for them to, to move forward. So um, there's an amendment to the conservation easement, which will also be coming before you. There's this amendment to their vesting agreement, et cetera, and then we will also record the amended CDPUD plan activity envelope um, their next step in the land use process will be to submit for site plan review for actual buildings that will be constructed under that plan. Um, that that would be you know a future step for them. Um, okay, thank so. you. Question for Suzanne. This yes. Um, it refers to acceptance of the amended deed of conservation easement will be considered. Origi yeah, originally we so had, that, sorry, I, I guess Is that actually being done at this meeting or not? That is not being done at this meeting. I've, I didn't catch that, that we were going to have them tag team for first and second reading, um, and then the conservation easement got held up. So it is, I don't know, Paul could speak to if that has been scheduled back in front of you. Um, I know they're working with the applicant to finalize the details on that, so I would assume it's coming pretty soon. Originally we thought we would do both at the same time. Okay, I was puzzling over so, it because I couldn't, it wasn't I, in the packet material. I didn't material. catch that from changing it after first reading, that they didn't have their first reading. Okay. So, good catch, though. <laughs> <laughs> this is a public hearing. Anybody wishing to comment on this? See none, bring it back to the board for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Can, someone, can we get someone to turn on the lights again? Yeah. 
Um, George, do you think we could take a five minute before we go into the two longer land use? Items. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll take a five minute break and uh, we'll get time to set up for the land use public hearings. Great, thank you.
Okay, we're on to our land use public hearings. The first is a resolution denying the HGL LLC extension reinstatement of vested rights. Thanks, George. Suzanne Wolf for community development. Um, the request is from HGL LLC, represented by Julie Wyckoff on my right, who's all, Julie's represented by Mitch Haas. Um, this property is right at the intersection of Highway 82 and Lower River Road. Um, I was just going to pull up maps and more to show you the, the pretty aerial photo, but um, this gives you a sense. I'll just... Uh, do I need to move that towards me? Um, here's Highway 82 running on this side of the property, and here's um, basically Lower River Road where it connects up. Um, and Lower River Road then continues on the other side of the river around and as it continues up valley. So right at that intersection, it's, I'll yeah. come back, I'll sit back down. Thanks. <laughs> um, it's referred to as the Snowmass Cottages property. Um, so there's a historic house, a number of cottages that also, some of which have historic significance, various other um, structures on the property. Um, there's a number of approvals. I mean, the original activity on the site dates back to the 40s when this was basically a kind of a resort um, with small cabins that were rented. Um, in more recent time in our, in our land use history, um, an approval was granted in 1997, um, which was actually the first, back when we, we would grant, put something on the historic inventory and provide um, the, an incentive at that time to build an additional single family residence to preserve an historic resource. Um, so that approval was granted, was not acted upon. Julie um, did not own the property at that time, but the, the, that approval was intact. Um, once Julie purchased the property, she came back in in 2006 um, and asked to reestablish the envelope that had been approved for that additional residence um, and obtain a new vested right. Um, that approval was granted right before, like the spring before we adopted the new code. So it's 2006, but it was still under the old code or the pre-2006 code. Um, so at that time, she recorded an agreement related to preservation of the historic structure. Um, but then still did not proceed with the building permit. Um, the board granted an extension of vested rights for that envelope approval in 2010, and at that time the applicant made some additional commitments. Um, the, originally the house that was, could potentially have been built was 5750. Um, on the property, and I guess just to quickly, I'll point to the, the envelope area, just so you know where that is. Um, and I guess what's important to note about that approval being granted before the new code went into effect in 2006 was that the setback from the river at that time was 20 feet. So the envelope was not subject to then our new code provision. So in that... Can you show us where the existing historic house is on that as well? Yes. And, uh, yeah, all the, all the different structures. So. It's right in the front corner. Okay. And that larger square piece that says vent pipes nest to it, what, is that the leach field for the Yes. Property? Yeah. Okay. Out, in the, yeah right, out in the area. Um, so in that 2010 extension of vested rights for the envelope, um, the applicant made a commitment to reduce uh, the allowable floor area for the residents to 3,500 square feet and reserved 1,000 square feet for a future use but not associated with that residence. So basically in terms of what would be built within that 100-foot setback, it was a reduction from 5,750 to 3,500 square feet. Um, as part of that approval, the board agreed to revest that building envelope with the 20-foot setback off of the river. Um, since then, um, the applicant has come in and obtained site plan approval, which grants a new vested right associated with that site plan, so a site plan for the residents within that envelope. Um, I can show you that if you'd like to see it, but a site plan approval was granted, um, and Julie did obtain a building permit um, to proceed with the, building the residence within that envelope. Um, and that was done before the vesting expiration last summer. 
Um, the permit's been approved, um, but once you submit for permit, you have a year to pick it up and get it issued or the permit dies. Um, and that deadline is fast approaching um, July 26th of 2017. Um, Julie's looking to extend her vested rights, um, in which case she would not pick, she would not have the permit issue. Um, she would not pay the final fees on the permit, which are about $18,000, which includes housing impact, you know, different, different types of fees that are required. Um, but she's looking to extend the vested rights for the approval as previously granted, which would maintain that envelope and the residents, you know, at the 20 foot setback and within the 100 foot setback off of the river. So that's basically our primary concern with um, the extension and reinstatement at this point in time. You know, Julie has, you know, the criteria related to has the applicant pursued the project. Julie clearly has, you know, met those standards. She, she has done all of the steps she needs to do to keep this alive over time. But at this point, you know, it's been 11 years since that approval was granted under the old code. Um, related to that issue with the setback. That's the big change that affects it. Um, you know, the applicant has presented that there is no alternative location. I don't feel that that's been truly demonstrated. I mean, there is a, set, a, a septic system in that upper, upper area, um, but we haven't, you know, it really hasn't been explored. You know, could that be accommodated? Could a septic system be moved to accommodate the residents in a different location on the property? Um, Anyway, I just don't think that that has really been explored at this point. Um, so given the concern with that continuing with the 20-foot setback under the old code provision, um, staff is recommending that the board deny the request to extend the vested rights. Questions for Suzanne? Yeah. Um, Rachel? Suzanne, perhaps if, if you can, uh, and, and if not, then perhaps Mitch can answer the question. Uh, if you were to draw the 100-foot setback, both, uh, I'd imagine, from Snowmass Creek connecting with the Roaring Fork and then the Roaring Fork, what, what would it leave in terms of um, developable property? I mean, if we know the existing site is about 20 feet. I'll have to, I don't know if I have anything in here to, to uh, scale off of. If the scale's over on the corner. Yeah, yeah. it's not, I don't know that that's scalable, though, because it's the 11 by 17. It's reduced. Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Um, I did a preliminary you, rudimentary drawing analysis of that. So and I, you'll I show it to us yeah. at the next. Uh, uh, okay. Um, and then I'm just kind of wondering, it, it's, it looks like um, one area over here says track 73. That, that's all still one parcel, even though it has different little track numbers in it. Is that correct. correct? Correct. This is showing the entire property boundary. Okay. And so there's no individual lot size around the historic house or the um, cabins. It's all just one. It's all one property. Thank you. Other questions for staff at this point? We could always come back. Uh, applicant. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I am on the record. My name is Mitch Haas. I'm with Julie Wyckoff, the owner of the property. Um, so. We went into this uh, really as a way to try to hit the pause button and not rush in, well, wouldn't, I don't know if you call it rushing anymore, but not <laughs> proceed so quickly at the, at the end of this time frame now with actually moving forward with the development of a 3,300 square foot residence 20 feet from the river. Uh, the, the idea was that approval is valid. There's a building permit just sitting, waiting to be picked up. Um, but recognizing that it's not the ideal development scenario for this property uh, for Julie for the greater Picking County. Um, the, the property has a long history as a tourist accommodations property. And we, Julie has interest in pursuing development more akin, more suitable to that history. Um, as we all know what happens around here, you build a residence close to the river and over time somehow these things morph into private residential properties. And we're, there, there is a genuine concern that once you build this house, you're 80% or so to the way of this property becoming a private residential property and maybe losing the cottage side of it. Perhaps it becomes somehow down the road more of a, a compound uh, residential. And 
the thought is we wanted to hit pause rather than pursue that and do this right away because that's what would have to happen unfortunately maybe unfortunately if the vested rights are not extended that that house is going to get built um and i, and I don't mean to put that out there as sort of a you know a, a a threat or or a, or anything along those lines just a reality the house would go ahead Julie will go ahead and pick up the permit and build it which is sort of the irony of it deny the vested rights because now we require a hundred foot setback if we deny the vested rights we're getting the 20 foot setback the house will be built 20 feet from the river if we extend the vested rights the whole point of doing so is that we take time to work with you and the county to pursue what should be better alternatives on this property, more, more in line with the tourist accommodations use of the property, uh, possibly a master plan, something considering a rezoning to the tourist zone district with restrictions, because we know the tourist zone district allows way too much floor area uh, to be appropriate here. Um, but the thought is if we hit a pause button and the pause being to extend the vested rights, we don't need to go ahead and pursue development to that house right away. And we can work with the county to explore what might be better options for everybody. Um, and those options, like I said, are, are looking towards using the tourist zone district to maybe create some kind of uh, meeting facility, uh, restaurant use, things that work with the cottages. Whether it's exactly those uses or not is, is what we would want to explore and how much might be appropriate and where on the site. Uh, but that's really where we're coming from. So, you know, I was a, not totally surprised with the recommendation because it's kind of become normal that when people request vested rights, the recommendation is not to grant it. Um, but in this case, you know, the, the trade offs that were granted in the past. Uh, limiting the size of the residents instead of 5750 to 3300 um, designating the old home to the historic register and listing four of the cabins on the historic inventory those don't expire those commitments stay with the property don't go away so the feeling wasn't by coming in and asking to hit the pause button and extend the vested rights to do some master planning with the county we didn't think we needed to offer more stuff you know it, it, is, is uh, it's, it's become sort of whether a right or not normal uh, standard operational procedure to offer a whole bunch of gifts when you ask for a vested rights extension. Um, our feeling is those three benefits stay with the property. They're not going anywhere. Um, so we didn't think we needed to come up with more things to offer. We thought what we were offering was a chance to stay the development of a home 20 feet from the river and instead explore what might be better more appropriate options so that's where we're coming from uh, whether that extension is three years that seems more than we probably need to do this we're thinking maybe something along the lines of 18 months uh, to continue working with staff and the county commissioners on possibly a rezoning or master plan that would go with the rezoning. Julie, did you want to add anything? No. Question? I think, that, I think you covered it. Questions for uh, the applicant? Well, again, I'd just like to see that rough map you oh, yes, said. Oh, um, That's okay. <laughs> and it is rough because it's a bunch of overlay sheets. So right. what I've done was take uh, You might have to, just why don't you put it on the Elmo? And I don't know if it'll fit. Will that work on it? I don't know. I don't know what you have. It'd be hard to line it all up. But, mm -hmm. uh, should we try this first, maybe? Yeah, you can try. <laughs> Just remember, Mike's. Got to unclip. It's a good use for the uh, old public notice signs. Is using them for public <laughs> <laughs> Any other microphones? We're missing some mics. 
So I'll, I'll yeah. run through a couple little overlays so that it makes some okay. sense. There we go. So we work with the, uh, the re to start with just the recorded uh, 1041 site plan. Okay. Maybe I'll, that shows. And then what I sort of tried to overlay and make sure I'm lining these back up properly. So we don't have mapping of the high water line for the entire property, uh, but that little yellow bit showing up is the high water line mapping. So the 100 foot setback is pointing to this line here. Would be about, would be the 100 feet off of there. Um, in between, this general area right through here is also sloped over 30%. So the area, you have the 100 foot setback runs across the property, uh, here we go, everything up there and wraps all the way around so that everything on the eastern side of the property is either floodplain, river setbacks, et cetera. The front end of the property also has a 100 foot setback off the highway uh, and that would be this line running through here. The river wraps all the way around the property back here. So, and we've also got a 50 foot collector street set back this direction. And then what I'm showing in the middle is where the septic field is. And then that box with utilities is a couple transformers, <coughs> a lot of utility meters, a lot of things that are, would be difficult and expensive to move from where they sit. Um, and they sit at the end of easements for these electric lines that run over. So you combine all of these things together and uh, really what's left under the county code is potentially developable is, you know, and I grant that this is a real preliminary analysis, sure, sure. Uh, is kind of this yellow checkered area in the center of the property. Uh, none of this accounts for a scenic review from the highway uh, and visibility. My thinking would be if development moved, you know, you probably could get away with developing already developed areas. Of course, these would require a variance from the river setback from 100 feet down to probably 50 feet, which is the most you can do that under the code. Um, and possibly some development within this overall envelope within the sloped area here. It's not particularly steep in here. So it'd be possible to move a building into that slope to sit here so that you'd reduce the height from the highway side and step down towards the river in that slope, but be able to get at least 50 feet off the river that way. Uh, otherwise, development would probably most likely sit right up here or where things already are, like this building and some parking that's out here today. Is that Yeah, that's helpful. helpful. Okay. That's helpful. Do you want me to leave this here or? No, I'm, well, I'm good. That was good information. How old is the septic system? How long has that been in place? Is that since the original development, the original? Uh... No, there are two. Oh, make sure there's a microphone. Um, I'm sorry, Julie, we're in this temporary okay. facility. It's, it's Hello, for grassroots. Um, there are two septic systems. One accommodates the historic log house that was built in 1884 as a stagecoach stop. And then the newer one, I believe, was put in or improved in when the highway was expanded. So, so we're gonna I'm gonna ballpark it at around 1995. So there has been improvements, and it was also designed to accommodate the I the idea of putting another house in. Right, and there were septic studies done with that 1041 approval um, and engineering done by uh, SGM engineers back at that time. Oh, I also want to say something right now. It has been 11 years, but time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> This was also punctuated by 2008, and that little 
loop that we all went through in, in different ways. So the impetus was interrupted to build this house during that time. So that's that. What? Where were we? Around 2000, yeah, the recession. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the punctuation. So uh, you know, really we're hoping, we're, we're trying in good faith to move in a better direction and work with the county. Or may, or to, sorry, okay. or to, and to add to that, or to all make, also make sure to explore moving in a better direction and make sure that this is really indeed part of the better direction. Other questions? Steve? Um, Julie, I know you've had the property for sale for at least several years, and um, I've run through different scenarios in my head. Like if we, if we gave the, ex extended the vesting rights with the 20-foot setback, with you having no intention of ever building that house, but then you sold the properties to, to a new owner, they very likely would, maybe that would be why they would buy the property to build that house within 20, you know, right on the river. And that would be my my biggest fear here, even though that wasn't your intention. So I've been trying to think in my mind, how how could we work with you to accomplish what you want on for the property uh, in the best way, even if you sold it, that it still would, the property would still be used in the way that you had envisioned. And so that's, that's what I've been struggling with in terms of, you know, the extension of the vesting right. Um, I, I see that extending the vesting with moving the setback 100 feet away from the river protects, that follows the, what the county code is now in protecting the river in the best fashion. Um, and I, I think looking at the maps, there would, there would be a way someone could build a house and there it might involve moving that upper septic field closer to the highway or something. And I don't know, I guess that'd be a question for Suzanne. Could the septic system be built in the highway setback area, moved closer to the highway or not? Yes, I mean, yeah, that could be accommodated through a variance or whatnot to allow it in that so septic. It would be or moving everything setback. away Sorry, from the river and closer to mm -hmm. the highway in a sense. Steve. Um, so that's, that's what I'm struggling with right now, and I, I don't have the answer yet, but that's what I'm hoping to reach that solution today. I think that that, is this working? I think that that's a good consideration. I'm not here to say I'm not building that house close to the water because I may, you know, well, I may be doing that in like six weeks, but I want to make sure it's the right thing to do. And as far as the sale of the property goes, I mean, I don't know. The property hasn't been for sale for four years. I have no intention of selling it right now, but I'm not saying I won't. So I, I just don't know how to factor in, I don't know how to um, deal with that future factor of the what if. But I do know for today what's going on. And Patty? Well, um, just in my past history when dealing with issues of vested rights, which we haven't had to do for a while, um, I've always been a supporter for the most part of extending vested rights because I believe in allowing the applicant to uh, come up with better solutions. Um, and there's always the threat, if I don't get my vested, I'm going to build. We know that. But there's always the thing that if I get my vested, I may still build. But I, I think, I, I know we're going to have concerns about that 20-foot river setback. That has been a, that was a huge decision for this board to make it to 100 feet. That was big. And I understand the reasons why. My hope would be that that house is not built there, but this property does come up with better use. It's an incredible piece of property. It's a huge amenity now to this community, and I think could be an even better amenity. Um, 
I would like to come up with a compromise in extending vestings to some period of time, but we need to really move on this because I can tell you if that extended vestings runs out, I don't think we're going to have a board sitting here that's going to say, okay, let's keep doing it. You know, there's a time when we have to draw the line and, um, you know, I'm thinking that I'm willing to allow some more time and let's work on this. Let's get it together and find out what really can be done to the benefit of that property. Um, rather than just saying no and putting you in a position of, okay, do I pull the permit and build, or what happens next? And, and I'm willing to go there. Rachel? Yeah, I, I, I would um, say that this presents a dilemma for us as much as it does for you. And uh, I, I agree with Patty. It's a beautiful property. I uh, spent a night or two there after my son was first born with my mother. So there's a little emotional attachment to some of those older cabins. Um, and I guess I really want to kind of explore this a little with Suzanne as much as anything. We can either extend the vested rights or not. We, we don't really have a chance to modify those at this point in time. I, I, I was kind of thinking, could we extend the vested rights for the home if it's moved back another 50 feet? And, and so that knowing that if it goes forward, as a home, it's going to be at least 70 feet back from the river uh, and on more of the slope and into the slope. But uh, if we, um, I, I really don't know that we can, quote, modify a vested right and then give you three years um, uh, if that's even allowed. On the allowed part, I'll, just, I'll say what, what make, what's difficult about that, I guess, is that what, they, what the approval today is a site plan mm -hmm. with a specific house location shown and, and how that all works on the property. So if you were to extend but with a condition that that site plan change, yeah, I don't know. There's an, you know, I don't know if right is. Then, do we want that amendment to the site plan in front of you, you know, yeah. to include with the, you know, the the extension of the vest right? I mean, I don't think you sort of leave it open ended. It's not as simple as an envelope. Before right. we were just right. dealing with an envelope and extending the rights for that. With the site plan, it's more tied to specifically what was approved. So I don't know if. Rye has any other thoughts on, you know, sort of more the legal side of that. But I just think it's it's a little more complicated because it would be a, a, a total change to the site plan, which might change what's been designed, you know, to fit in the location where it works now. That would get into that, you know, a little bit more of a slope. Mitch, Mitch mentioned it probably is a different house at that point. Yeah, and again, I, I like Steve, am trying to think about what are potential solutions. Um, I don't need to tell you how, how often we've heard from uh, our community development director, zone it like you mean it, and not just, you know, it, <coughs> it has been a, a land use change now for a, a significant period of time, as you've said, um, 11 years. Um, on the other hand, uh, moving forward to construction tomorrow or in the next few weeks, it just gives you a river, you know, house 20 feet from the river. So uh, I really, I don't have any easy solutions. Hey, I'll make uh, some remarks. I, I'm really not a fan of extending uh, vesting rights in general. I've always uh, uh, been opposed to that for those reasons. That's why we have land use code changes, because we want to uh, enhance uh, those, uh, those attributes around our county, whether it be uh, scenic views or, or r river uh, stream uh, frontages. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why we continue to improve and revise our land use codes. Uh, so by extending vesting rights, it just allows the applicant to continue to ride under the old codes. In most cases, uh, not in all cases, but, but in many cases, to enable that property to be more saleable because everything is saleable, saleable in Pickens County. Um, and so... This is a, I understand this is a noble request. Uh, I, I take a little offense with the idea of that uh, the gifts have been given and they will, they will continue to be given. Those gifts, those community benefits, uh, were why the uh, 2010 vesting rights were approved. Otherwise, they would not have approved then. Uh, the pause button, well, it's been 11 years. That's a long pause. The last vesting rights was 2010. 
So I understand the concerns uh, in terms of not having a, a home built in 20 feet uh, from the river. I'm not sure that's really going to happen in the next couple of weeks or not. Um, I would offer a compromise and, and look at a one-year uh, finality of a vesting right. And if that doesn't work, Julie shaking her head, then I would say I would be opposed to that. So I'll throw that out for the board to consider. One-year extension of the existing vested rights? Yes. And building permit rights? I was that looking at 18 months. <laughs> I don't think it's yeah, I won't go and that would months. be George with a 20 foot setback well, that's, that's in place. It, it based you can't on, change it. But that's, based one, on year, what that's one year for, for uh, the applicant to really make a decision of what they're going to do or not do. Uh, I think that's more than generous uh, given the amount of time that's already been given to this property. So I'll throw that out for further discussion. I appreciate George doing that because I know that's a huge decision for George. This is something George and I agree we don't agree on all the time. Um, but I would still say I think one year is really tight. Um, I think three years is probably too long. So Mitch had thrown out 18 months, and I think that's probably more workable for the applicant and, and for staff. And so I think that would be a fair compromise. Um, I don't think it's going the full three years and up. It's not going a full two years. So that's kind of the position where I would be right now. But we'll wait for the rest of the commissioners to, to speak their minds. I think I could live with an 18-month extension. Um, if we denied the extension today, Julie could get the building permit and start building immediately. If um, I don't, you, at at the current location, it would okay. give the 18 months. She still might build on that current location, but it gives her the time to <clears throat> contemplate the other the other options that you're looking at. But the 18 months will fly by really quickly, and you need to keep working with Mitch and Suzanne and try to come up with you know the long range plan that you actually exactly. actually want. If you'd wanted to build that house, you. You would have already been building it right now, so you know I, I, I feel right. good about that. That you want something different than that. But you just haven't figured it out yet. Right. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a uh, public hearing. Anybody wishing to comment on this from the public? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Hmm. Greg, just I'm just I'm just I'm, what I'm interested in is is that. Uh, you say you want to consider alternatives, but I, I, I don't know if this is the place to to be looking and discussing them or seeing them. But you know, the presentation with the overlays is great, but it looks like it was done very hastily. So I, have, have you really made any progress on other on other solutions? I, I love the place, and I know you do, and I know you've you've given a lot oh, in terms of concessions in the past. So it seems as if this is the right direction to go. But I'm just kind of wondering, you know, why is it taking so long to, you know, we're pushing the deadline now, and and I, it, it'd be interesting to see if the, if there are any more formal ideas have you've evolved that we could you could share with us about what you think you want to do. Yeah. Well, let me start, and then Julie can <laughs> talk about like what her actual visions for the property are and what she'd like to see happen there. But uh, we, we only started working together not very long ago at all, probably a week before we submitted this vested rights application. Uh, we started looking at it and we said, well, the first thing we've got to do is find a way to hit a pause button so you don't need to go build that house. Um, okay, so so this is a new relationship we're looking at. Yeah, okay. yeah. Julie worked for years with Alan Richmond, who's a very good friend of mine. Alan had other commitments and asked if I would be able to sub in, if you will. Um, so we haven't had a lot of time. We started looking at zoning possibilities and what zone districts might fit. And we've done a little looking at the tourist zone, which seems to fit. Granted, we would want to restrict the zoning because it allows too much. Um, and we recognize that. So that's kind of as far as we've gotten so far because we didn't want to go too crazy or spend too much of Julie's money. Uh, if there was no point, because if the vested rights don't get extended, then we were kind of done, and it was going to be go ahead and build the house. Uh, so that's kind of as far as we've gone on that end of it. Um, I do appreciate 
George's willingness to consider any kind of extension, knowing the history and how, and how you normally feel about vested rights extensions. So I, I do appreciate that. And the reason we had come up with 18 months uh, is it takes a lot of time to do these things. One, Julie would have to put together a whole new building permit application for that house to keep that possibility alive. Uh, and that takes time to do. And getting in front of boards and having hearings about rezonings, uh, about master plans, and putting together an application ahead of all of that takes some doing. Uh, and one year I just know is tight. I, I know how long these things tend to take. Um, so a year and six months seem like an adequate window, whereas if we're getting, if we're making good progress and we're getting towards the end of that, then we can discuss whether any additional time is needed or not. Hopefully it wouldn't be, but it uh, seems like a year would, would cause us to be rushed too much and put us back in the same position we're finding ourselves in for the last couple months now. Or 11 years. Or for the 11 years <laughs> for Julie's sake. Uh, so in terms of what she's envisioning for the property, uh, better you explain what your thoughts are. You, you have visions of Use the microphone. And, um, <laughs> This has been a resort. It was built in 1948 as a year-round fishing, skiing resort. The log house, the stagecoach stop, was a restaurant until, I think, 1967. And it would be wonderful to kind of reinstigate that whole concept in a more contemporary way. It's also a very beautiful, sunny, I don't know why place for greenhouses and gardens that would go with a farm to table situation. But clearly the tourist zone was almost, in my opinion, written for the for an opportunity for the cottages to move forward in more of a commercial situation. You know, the, the problem is, um, as everyone knows, uh, the land costs are so high in Pitkin County uh, to look at developing um, any sort of tourist accommodations, if you can get it through zoning uh, um, and with caucuses input, uh, to make that work is extremely difficult in terms of just economics. So there's a lot of good ideas, whether it be greenhouses or or uh, tourist accommodations. I know there's been other attempts to. Uh, He's sorry, Gord, did you just speak up a little bit? Other attempts to to uh, to bring in prospective buyers for the property that have fallen apart uh, for a variety of reasons. A, a lot just due to the cost of the land. So, um, you know, a year gives the, gives the applicant to do some preliminary work to get in front of the caucus to get their input to see. Uh, to work with the staff to see what's actually even within the realm of feasibility or not. Um, you know, you can go 18 months, you can go two years. It's a long process, I understand, but at some point you got to fish or cut bait. So I'm going to stay with uh, one year in terms of my support. Rachel? Yeah, you know, um, I was hoping you hadn't made that pronouncement because I was just going to offer is there a way to split the baby I, I understand the issue of timing and and the challenge of getting anything moving forward um, maybe I was thinking of 15 months so it's just splitting the difference between a year and a half and and uh, one year and wishing you well and also you know creating a, a, a timeline that's not as tight but is still tight and, and says that you have to move and make a decision and so you know, this is challenging for me. Uh, as, I, as we all know, there's consequences the community may not like from not ascending, and there may be, but, but there won't be different consequences from extending. That seems to be the challenge. I mean, we don't like to play poker. I don't. I don't think you're playing poker. Uh, you know, the obvious question is, well, does she really have the funding to pick up the permit and start the construction? Or yes, she does. Yes, she does. And yes, she is ready will. to and, go and, pick up the permit. And so I'm just saying that you know, one way or the other, 
and not specific to you, that's always a question in the back of people's minds when they're uh, having these sort of discussions. Um, I would note that um, the memo, at least, and I, I would be um, I readily believe it, uh, that there's been significant investment in in pre-planning activities and getting a building envelope and getting a site design and and things like that. And uh, it'd be hard for me to look at the um, diligence that has been paid and the the issues that have been resolved and the deed restrictions or the rather excuse me listing of the historic structures um, and, and not say hey there should be some accommodation here uh, as much as I'm very concerned about the river frontage as well um, so that's why I'm going to give it a try and see if there's any uh, support or majority support to make a motion to uh, approve extension of the vested rights for a period of 15 months. Well, I need to make comment, though. Well, if there's no second, it'll no. die. I'll second it. Well, uh, I'm just going to go back. You know, George's point was well made, but what he said exactly, well, well, in my interpretation of what you said, was that it takes a lot of time, and hopefully in a year you can get before the caucus. And that doesn't mean you're going to get to the end result of having something to bring back to us when vesting runs out. If vesting runs out in a year and you haven't gone through the whole process and been approved, are you going to be revested or are you done? That's why I'm trying to be really fair and honest, knowing, you guys, how long it takes to get stuff to a caucus to a caucus and back again, how long it takes to get on P&Z agendas or back on our agendas. And I think, Rachel, I appreciate your 15 months, but I still think we're cutting it short. I still think 18 months is just better for us and better for the applicant and better for our staff to give a, you know, take a deep breath and give that little bit more time. Steve? Uh, one consideration is Rachel is coming to the end of her term a little yeah. less than 18 months from now. <coughs> and I think it would be fair to Julie to have this board be the one to hear it and not an, a board with a new member who's mm. new to the process, totally unfamiliar with this property possibly. Um, Good and point. So if, in fairness to you, I'd like to have the process done while Rachel is still on the board, which... Let's make it two years. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, that's a great point, but I don't think we've ever made a decision based on who's going to be who's yeah. going to be in office. No, because uh, I, I could leave office tomorrow and be replaced, or yeah. you could decide yeah. to leave office yeah. tomorrow. But that's yeah, a nice I, I thought. I, I, I appreciate that thought. <laughs> you know, I guess my thinking in this um, number we've thrown out, you know, and any could be arbitrary, and sometimes um, tasks end up expanding to take the amount of time allotted. You know, and my feeling would be that if in the f 15 months these guys are able to come back and say, hey, we're 80 percent of the way there, we'd like a one-year extension, that's not an unusual request, and it's not at that out of line if that's where it is. But they could show we've got these plans, we've been in front of this caucus, we've done this. It would show additional diligence. I just don't want to get to three months before the end of two years, and no, we haven't. Or, you know, literally do the 15-month extension, and um, for unforeseen circumstances today, um, the property's back on the market in 30 days, and, uh, you know, it's proceeding to sale as is you know and and the whole extension was a hope you know and, and that's what it is the extension is a hope and so I think 15 months would be enough time to find out if there's any legitimacy in it and if it's not enough time but it's progressing well and you know they're starting to have something to show for that time we can look at an extension again but well, so I, I think that's a really good point and since you will still be on the board in 15 months, I'm going to remind you of that if you're going to convince me of this vote right now. So, okay. Looking at the other gentleman sitting over there in the middle. Great. I just have to, I have to clarify. So what, what you're saying, Rachel, is, is 15 months, and then if things are progressing, you would even consider uh, extending it from there? If they if were able to come in and say, here's this master plan, uh, we've had our first hearing in front of planning and zoning, uh, we've visited the caucuses, um, uh, but planning and zoning hasn't scheduled us again for another two months, it's going to fall outside. Yeah, I would consider that. I mean, it's just it, it, if work is being done and, and diligence is being pursued during that time period. Okay. <laughs> I, I, Greg? I, I like what I hear Rachel saying. Um, uh, 
the question, of course, the first thing that pops into my mind, of course, is the river. It's, the, it's, it's about the river. And I'm going to assume here, only because I'm new, that as you're pursuing a new development plan for this, it's not going to include something 20 feet from the river. It's going to be significantly farther back in whatever. And I'm, I'm hoping that that's why we're all here discussing this. So what can you tell us about this? Is, is, there, is there any other any other thing you can tell us about your vision for I'm this? I'm not well, ready to commit that this future vision will not include a structure that's 20 feet from the river. I'm not guaranteeing that I'm coming back and this site goes away. Well, what we do know is any new approvals would have to be under the current code. And the closest you exactly. can possibly get to the yeah, river under the current feet. code, even with a variance, is 50 feet from the high water line. Well, there you have it. There you have it. <laughs> I'm shutting up. <laughs> Probably a good thing. <laughs> so, so we know it would be at, at the worst 30 feet further from the river than this house, uh, if not right. more than that. Every little bit counts. You know, and as far as the... <laughs> You said you were shut I don't know what you're going to say. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to can of warm it here, but go ahead, Mitch. We, <laughs> we, have, we, we, we have a motion. Do we have a yeah. motion? We have a motion and a second on the table. a second. Um, is there any further board discussion? Uh, I'm going to still support staff's uh, recommendation to deny. I, I think uh, staff understands all the consequences as, as well as we do. But there's, uh, there's been ample time uh, to look at all these different options, and this is sort of a, a last-minute uh, straw hope. Um, so with that, I will. Uh, George, a uh, point of order. The ordinance that we have before us is a motion to, is to deny the extension. Yeah, well, written I, didn't, one I, didn't, we have? I didn't make the motion to include that resolution. I, I just made the motion. So this is like a new yeah. ordinance that, we'll come that's not I don't know package. if it's an ordinance or resolution, that we would, that Suzanne would have to write up the, with the information, is that correct? Well, right. right. It wouldn't Staff necessarily could. come back in front of you. Yeah. So if you want to approve it rather than deny it, you approve it. With the findings that you know what's been discussed, for a new resolution months. would be drafted for signature. Fifteen months. <laughs> Try to slip that eighteen back in there. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Thank you. Thank you. I respect that decision, George. I understand the challenges. The one the 15 month All right. Thank you. Let's see. We've got another long one coming up. Uh, board want to take a 10 minute break? Yeah. Then yeah. Grassroots, 10 minute break. That's what she said. That's what she said. I was sure.
Okay, next is 501 Buttermilk LLC Skybeam Subdivision. And it's an ordinance rezoning 501 Buttermilk LLC property with a plan unit development. That's a first reading. And then along with that is a resolution approving the Skybeam Subdivision PUD conceptual submission and activity envelope. Again, a first reading. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Kramer with Picking County Planning Staff. And um, as introduced, this is the 501 Buttermilk LLC application. Uh, the applicant is named Skybeam Subdivision. Uh, next to me is Mitch Haas, who is representing 501 Buttermilk LLC. And the location, as, as indicated, is 501 West Buttermilk Road within our Aspen Urban Growth Boundary. The zoning on this lot is AR10. That's an agricultural residential 10-acre zone district with a 10-acre lot minimum. The subject parcel is 37 acres and is a meets and bounds parcel. Um, I think uh, this property has a long history uh, with transactions and, and property owners and, and um, previous applications. Uh, George, if you don't mind, I think I'd like to go through and verbalize some of that uh, sure. that paragraph that I put in the staff memo um, and clearly outline what the applicant is requesting, what the BOCC's purview is, what the PNZ's purview is and was, um, and what we're doing here today, if that's okay. That'd be great. Okay. Um, so I have a map up on the screen. This is our uh, pick and maps and more, and the subject parcel is highlighted in yellow. As I mentioned, it's 37 acres. Um, and for reference on where this parcel is located, this is Highway 82 running north and south in this section. Up to the northeast here is uh, our Aspen Airport Business Center. Uh, this is Owl Creek Road as it traverses along the dry hillside and along our airport, which is located right here. Um, as you come off uh, Highway 82 and Owl Creek Road, uh, you make a left onto uh, West Buttermilk Road, and there's a switchback here. And there's a second switchback um, before you get up to the Mesa. And this parcel um, is long, as you can see, um, and is currently developed with a single family residence of 7,000 square feet. Uh, to the east of this parcel, um, property is owned by the city of Aspen with a conservation easement that is uh, held by Aspen Valley Land Trust, uh, AVLT. The city of Aspen also owns this property right here. Uh, these are both open space parcels with no intention to be developed. To the west of the subject parcel is the Aspen Oaks Homeowners Association subdivision. Uh, and you can see there's multiple parcels there. There's also um, multiple residential meets and bounds parcels to the south here. And then obviously Buttermilk Mountain, which you, which you can't see. You can kind of see the half pipe right here. But um, Buttermilk Mountain is right here. So that, that's the vicinity of where this, where this property is. Um, this property was part of the Burlingame Ranch Affordable Housing Project. Um, and in 1999, the city of Aspen was the owner of the subject property. And uh, it was always the city's intent, as I understand, to uh, take this property, gain land use approvals, and sell it for private development uh, to refund the affordable housing uh, cost that was associated with the Burlingame Ranch development. And Burlingame Ranch, is, as you can see, is where are we here? Uh, Over that back way. Back, am, am I too far? Yeah. Yeah, it's Stage that one. includes Deer Hill. Was I? Oh, there it was. Okay, yep. Back over here. Um, so this property was associated with that. And in 2000, uh, the city of Aspen applied for what we then called 1041 building envelope approval for the property and, and gave, gained approval to develop a single-family residence. At that time, uh, the city of Aspen attempted to place a conservation easement on the subject property that would encumber uh, the remaining portion of the property except for the building envelopes. Now, this map uh, is in a gross scale, and, and Mitch here is going to get into more detail of um, where the uh, existing development is and also the proposed lot. Um, and he's got maps to show that, but I'm going to use this gross scale to show uh, the background and the history of the parcel. The parcel. But um, basically, this area of the parcel which you can kind of see underneath the transparency of the yellow is where the single family residence got developed the remaining portion of the property up to the north was then placed uh, supposedly in a conservation easement that conservation easement was held to the benefit of the aspen oaks homeowners association uh, and they are the association to the west right here um, the property transacted in 2002 
and in, two, and a single family residence was built and as I said it's, it's about 7,000 square feet that, that residence still exists today. In 2009 an application was submitted to community development and the application was for a subdivision application to split the lot into two, uh, two lots. Lot one would retain the existing single family house and lot two would be a new house and at that time uh, growth management quota systems uh, development right was applied for for the new lot and I'll get into the process of that in a second. Um, that application uh, was um, part of the application we, we knew there was an issue with the conservation easement staff was aware of it the city of Aspen was aware of it at the time um, and that applic application played out in uh, recommended denial by uh, staff and ultimately by the P&Z and then ultimately uh, appealed to the Board of County Commissioners and at that appeal the application was denied um, a lawsuit ensued um, and the applicability of the conservation conservation easement came into play and uh, rendered from that lawsuit uh, was a decision from Pickham County District Court that stated that the uh, conservation easement was of, quote, uh, no legal force and effect and does not encumber the property. And that was in 2011. Uh, that is not uh, the same owner that is Mitch's client today. It was a different owner. Um, so fast forward to today, um, the, app, uh, the property transacted to a new property owner and uh, the 501 Buttermilk LLC is requesting a subdivision application um, and uh, has a GMQS application that has been approved by the PNZ uh, with an allotment of 10,750 square feet of floor area allocated by the Board of County Commissioners. Um, so that's some background and I'm, I'm going to get into process too because I'm sure there's going to be some questions about <laughs> the PNC's purview and the board's purview and all that. Um, so just give me a second, I'll, I'll get into that too. Um, so our request here, as I, as I stated, uh, is to subdivide the lot into two lots. And as I stated, the, the parcel is 37 acres. And um, the property being developed with a single family residence right here of 7,000 square feet. The property, property line gets established, proposed to be established right about here. And as I said, Mitch will get into uh, the inset and more detailed maps on that. Um, lot one would be effectively uh, the existing single family residence plus the remaining portion here. Of lot one, a 26 acre conservation easement was proposed as part of the GMQS application and accepted by the PNZ. Um, and uh, that would encumber the rest of the property and prohibit any further subdivision of this land. Lot two would then be approximately five acres and would uh, sit right here on the southern portion of the property. Um, the applicant at this time is only requesting activity envelope review and as you know activity envelope and site plan review is required prior to a building permit application. Now um, there is no requirement at this time for the applicant to submit for a site plan. The applicant is only requesting activity envelope and it is acknowledged in the staff memo and it is well aware by uh, Mitch and his client that site plan review, future site plan review would be needed uh, to show us where the, where the future house would go and how the um, access would be um, established on the property and where utilities would be. Um, so that's the, the background and the request. The process um, is, I'll, I'll break it out uh, for the board. Um, this is a conceptual subdivision and PUD request. And conceptual subdivision is, is, is essentially two different applications. One is what we're, here, we're doing here today, conceptual subdivision. We get to see a conceptual idea of where the lot lines would be established for lot one and lot two. Um, PUD, we, we hear that acronym a lot. It, it stands for planned unit development. And what that means is that, in, in this case, is that uh, the applicant uh, acknowledges that the AR-10 requires a minimum lot size of 10 acres. Because a conservation easement is proposed with this property, the applicant is requesting PUD zoning uh, overlay on this property so that lot one can contain approximately 31 acres. Lot 2 can contain approximately 6 acres and we acknowledge that Lot 2 does not conform to the minimum lot size uh, for that zone district. Um, however, with the PUD request, they can vary that lot size, acknowledging that the balance or the aggregate of those two lots conforms to the a AR-10 zone district. Um, in theory, with 37 acres and 10 acre zoning, somebody could have three uh, building sites subject to review and approval. 
Um, this application is only for two. Uh, lot one, which contains uh, the single family residence that exists today, plus that conservation easement, and then lot two, which would be the, the newly developed lot. So, uh, with a two step review of this portion, uh, the PNZ is the recommending body, which they have reviewed and recommended approval for. The BOCC is the deciding body on this portion of the application. In association uh, with subdivision application of this nature, uh, growth management quota systems uh, competition request is, is part of it. And what that is, is the acronym is GMQS. And uh, Mitch has applied for and has successfully attained a new development right for a 10,750 square foot residence on the new, uh, newly created lot two. And with that GMQS commitment, um, well, I, let me back up. I'll say with that GMQS request, the PNZ is uh, the deciding body on that. Um, uh, with two hearings at the PNZ, uh, the PNZ adopted staff's proposed scoring, uh, the application met threshold, and the commitments that were made in that in those PNZ hearings and uh, the GMQS portion of the application will play out if the subdivision uh, is approved by the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and as I stated, because the PNZ is the reviewing and deciding body on that, that portion of the application, the board will not be reviewing that portion. But there are some significant commitments that were made, notably establishing correctly a conservation easement on lot one, the 26 acre conservation easement uh, that would preclude any future development on the northern portion of the lot. Um, also proposed is a public trail easement uh, that would go through this lot and potentially connect to the Butterline Trail. Um, and I can actually show where that is. Um, Butterline Trail is one of our newly created single tracks along the base on Owl Creek Road. Um, Mitch has proposed and the PNZ accepted to uh, establish a conservation easement that would allow for public access to connect to that trail. Um, the trail would not be constructed at this time. Um, but potentially in the future. Um, that would be a part of the plat. Um, also part of the GM Caress request that was significant uh, was um, participation in uh, monetary funds for another single track connector trail across um, Buttermilk Mountain to connect essentially the, the government trail to our, our Picking County single tracks and City of Aspen single tracks that access Sky Mountain Park. Um, that commitment was also accepted by the PNZ. Um, Another commitment that was made, and, and you might hear from Mitch in his application, was that there will be some uh, above grade and below grade uh, commitments as part of the new single family residence. 8,250 square feet uh, was, a, was an above grade commitment with the remaining of that floor area into subgrade space or, or basement, and that plays out in the resolution too. Um, so those are some of the highlights that the PNZ got to hear and got to review and scored uh, the application to meet threshold to establish a development right for the, for the, for the property. Can I ask a real quick question? Yeah, since, sure. since GMQS allotment was approved by planning and zoning with those, with those gifts, as we were calling them earlier, <clears throat> um, if for some reason the subdivision that's currently, the rezoning was not approved now, do, does GMQS, they still hold that 10,000 whatever square feet and their agreements to uh, allow for those trails? Is it, is it a done deal or is it a gone deal? Um, I can't, I don't, I'm not sure if GMQS I should answer no or yes, but if, if the board does not approve this, this application, those commitments will not be followed through with, with Mitch's client. Because there's no opportunity for, at that point for them to use their GMQS allotment. Exactly. Okay, that's the clarification. Yes. The, Thank the, you. the development is tied to those commitments. If the development never happens, they won't be made. Perfect. But just uh, just to follow up with that, just so I understand, in terms of GMQS process, um, how, 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 how do they arrive at that, that uh, square footage? Uh, given that um, the by right, you're allowed 5750, and understanding GMQS, you could utilize that as a way not to have to use TDRs, but TDRs, each TDR is only worth 2,500 square feet. So so how, how do they get to over, over 10,000 square feet? Um, well, and just to clarify too, the the reason GMQS is applied for is because in Pickens County, when a subdivision application is filed, 
that newly proposed lot does not have a development right, and a development right needs to be attained either through GMQS and the application that, that was submitted, or your, your correct ten, or, uh, uh, TDRs. Um, we can ask Mitch how his client came to 10,750 uh, square feet. That was their ask. That was their ask, yes. And so P&Z at that point could have, uh, they did approve it, but they could have said, no, we're, that, that really falls under the, uh, the purview of P&Z to determine how much they're going to allow for that square footage? Well, no, the, I see Suzanne shaking the P her head. <laughs> uh, uh, we can tag team it, sure. Because <laughs> that, that's, that's going to end up being, I think, being discussed as one of the issues, I suspect. So. The, the applicant applies for a specific square footage. Again, <clears> new <throat> development right. They have no right today. So they have, for their new lot, zero square feet. So there is no 5750 base. They ask for as much as they ask for. The zoning here allows up to 15,000 square feet. The scoring system accommodates if you're, well, actually, this is urban growth rates. Did Inside you get, growth, so was, were there points related to a reduction in size? So no, it it's actually doesn't apply. But so <laughs> they, they pick their number, what they want to build. Okay. The PNZ is scoring it based on the request made by the applicant. There's no oh, okay. discussion in there about what's an appropriate size. They score it based on what's requested by the applicant. Oh, okay. That's All right, thank you. answer to that. Good question. Uh, questions uh, for Mike? Well, <coughs> or are you done with your presentation? I don't think he's done yet. So, I don't think he's done. Sorry. No, a I, only a couple more, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'll jump. You on. might answer my questions. <laughs> I, I'll just get through a few more items here, and, and I'll stop talking then. So, um, <clears throat> that's the GMQS portion of that. Um, there is a rezoning portion of this then too, and that's the PUD planned unit development overlay that would then acknowledge that uh, lot two does not conform to the minimum lot size in the AR10 zone district but acknowledges that the totality of the two lots does conform and that that requires a rezoning you'll see in your packet that you have an ordinance acknowledging that including a, a resolution um, so th those are the processes um, p and z uh, and boCC purviews on that as far as process goes Got it. and I can keep going unless see if you want to ask your question on process okay uh, first question, what are the house sizes of other houses in the neighborhood? Hmm. Do you have a, I know the, the one on this, this parcel is like 7,500 approximately square feet, but how about the others along Aspen Oaks and across the road and whatnot? I don't have a number on Aspen Oaks subdivision, but as you climb and, and get over into the Owl Creek side, or, uh, um, Brush the other side of that, there are larger residences, but it, as far as the immediate George. vicinity, I don't have that number. An um, audience member might have the answer. Man, let's just wait on that. I, I don't want to get into... Okay, uh, maybe that could be answered later. Yeah. Yep. Um, was the Aspen Oaks subdivision also part of the Burlingame land that the city of Aspen owned, or was it a separate ownership? Separate. <clears throat> was part of the same? No, it was separate. A, it was separate. separate ownership. Okay, so that was... A, not have anything to do with this parcel aside that it's just next to it um what what is the exact location of the or locations of the proposed mountain bike trail uh to me it's like the they i think that they probably offered the mountain bike trail as a means of gaining points for the gmqs system and so, in effect, the PNZ was approving a mountain bike trail that we have no idea whether it's appropriate or not. And I just want to see where, where the, I know a couple of possible alignments were suggested by Mike Pritchard, but uh, do, do you actually know where the ones? I have all of that in my. And maybe, Mitch, you could yep. answer that when we get to your part. Mike wants to. Or if Mike yeah. knows. I'm going to let Mitch do that. He's got a, a full presentation um, outlining where those locations okay. are. Yeah. Um, and then the CDU in the existing house, uh, what is it still existing and how is it being used by the owners? Um, it's sort of like they, they already have two dwelling units there, one CDU and one the main, the main house on the property. <coughs> So I just want to be sure on uh, 
you know, establishing the fact of what, you know, what is actually there. Yes. Um, that's a good question. Uh, the existing house does have a CDU, and as to my knowledge, it is being used as a CDU. Um, and uh, it, a CDU, a, a caretaker dwelling unit, doesn't actually uh, count for a unit of density on the property. It is specifically identified as, as accessory to a single family residence and, and does not, like I said, count towards that. It does not implicate the subdivision request. And a CDU can be used as guest quarters or whatever, mother in law quarters or anything that the owner. Which is, is that is that correct? Uh, almost, um, <laughs> but yes, family can stay there, and uh, if family doesn't stay there and a renter is is pursued, uh, then the renter would have to qualify with our APSHA, APSHA. Um, guidelines for renting that unit. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's all for now. Okay. Um, there were two previous uh, P&Z hearings on this item, and December 13th, 2016, and May 7th, I'm sorry, May 2nd, 2017, were those two previous hearings. And um, at the time, uh, an issue came up regarding water service. And as I, as I wrote in my staff memo here, Buttermilk Metro Service uh, provides water uh, to this area. The subject parcel is within the Buttermilk Metro District. And when the application was made for subdivision, one of the land use code requirements is that the applicant show proof of adequate water supply. And with the submission, the applicant provided a letter from the Buttermilk Metro District stating they have capacity to provide um, water to the newly created lot if approved and subject to the uh, payment of the, of the TAP fees. Um, the application was taken in, and at the December 13th, 2016 hearing, a representative from the Buttermilk Metro District uh, was present and spoke and stated that uh, water service uh, was still under discussion with the Metro District. So at the hearing, uh, the PNZ elected to continue the application until a letter uh, verifying that water service could be provided uh, to the subject uh, new lot uh, um, was uh, provided and then uh, ultimately provided the PNZ uh, for verification. Um, so that took a little bit of time, a number of months between December and May, um, and the applicant ultimately attained that second letter from the Buttermilk Metro District, and uh, we're operating under the understanding that water service is available from the Metro District. Um, also at the uh, PNZ hearing, there were uh, a couple neighbors that were present, and we've outlined their comments as best we could in the staff memo. Um, some might be here today to, to speak to it, too. Um, there were a, a couple changes in the GMQS portion of the application um, that Mitch's client uh, committed to and the PNZ acknowledged. Um, some of those uh, talked about uh, donations for trail construction in the vicinity of the, the subject parcel. Uh, the applicant also committed to above grade limitations and below grade limitations in association with their, their 10,750 square foot uh, request. Um, and then also, uh, and Mitch can explain this too, um, in conversations with some of the neighbors, there was concern about visibility of the lot from some of the neighbor parcels. And you'll see uh, um, some specifics about the uh, 80, 95 foot elevation line. And that was a, an idea that came up that uh, the house, w the future residence on lot two would not uh, uh, be constructed higher than that elevation line. And uh, we can let uh, the applicant uh, express those ideas. Um, at that time, uh, neighbors were present too um, at the PNZ hearing. But the uh, Planning and Zoning, Zoning Commission ultimately recommended approval to the board uh, for the activity envelope and the uh, PUD and conceptual subdivision request. And the PNZ also voted and approved the GMQS portion of the application. Um, so that's the, that's the background uh, on the process and the previous PNZ hearings. Um, and like I said, we'll hear, we'll hear more specifics on the, um, from Mitch and, and what his request is. So I don't want to talk too long, but overall, uh, staff has two or uh, well, an ordinance and a resolution in the BOCC packet. One ordinance uh, is to approve the rezoning of the subject property uh, to with a PUD overlay, and the second is a resolution with conditions. And uh, that resolution uh, is applicable and specific to uh, this development in Lot 2 and has some specificity regarding scenic view overlay uh, development um, above the 8095 line. Um, and you'll notice, too, that uh, first reading is set for today, obviously, a public hearing. And second reading is set for July 26. Um, that's a quick turnaround time, but those were the calendar dates that worked. 
if the if the board is not comfortable or not ready to move forward with second reading, those those dates would be amended then. So, uh, Mike, just so I understand this, uh, because there's two, there's an ordinance in front of us and a resolution, and I don't know which which would come first, which pertains to the other. So, in other words, if if the conceptual uh, subdivision is not approved, then there's really no need for a rezoning. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Rachel. Yeah, um, Mike, I'm wondering if you could show us what is the activity envelope surrounding the existing single family home? I can show that. Great. Um, I'm going to show two maps here. Um, the first is the 1999 slash 2000 uh, building envelope that was approved when the city of Aspen owned it. Um, I'm going to use the pointer. Uh, the property boundaries are here. And the envelopes that were approved for the existing development are located right here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scroll down and, and show a, a zoomed in portion of that too. Okay, this is the second switchback on uh, West Buttermilk Road. And this is where access is taken to the existing house. And if I'm reading this correctly, this was the building envelope. This was the sec septic envelope that was approved. And this is the access envelope. Okay. And, and I was just saying, where is the proposed lot two? Proposed just lot two. Um, lot line is proposed approximately right here. And the new lot two would be, uh, well, the building envelope is proposed right here. The entirety of lot two is this area right here. It includes the part of the loop on Buttermilk Road, the opposite side of the road? It does, yes. A little whoop de doo in there? Um, That's a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, uh, the proposed lot two, and, and we'll met, let Mitch show the lot lines, okay. um, it includes the switchback right here. Right, thank you. Yep. Okay. And so if you could go back up to your first map there sure. a little bit. Did you want the aerial map, Rachel, or uh, this no, one? No, this one that okay. you have. So um, the conservation easement is then going to be on the whole area that's extending out, uh, up towards the top of your map? Correct. Um, the little pinch point there. Yep, from, um, from about this pinch point right here to the entirety of this portion of the parcel. Um, and it's represented that that area is 26.6 acres. Okay. And one, one last time down to the lower map. I'm sure, so sure. sorry to have to keep you toggling back and forth. Um, this might be easier. Oh, I'm just sure. looking a little bit at the, the topo lines here. It, it, it looks like this new potential lot is really very much up on a hillside as opposed to the existing lot is kind of down in, in the gully. Is that somewhat accurate description? Um, this, steep, this is a steep hillside, dry hillside that we can all see from Highway 82. And as a reference point, every, I think everyone knows that utility cut along the mm -hmm. dry hillside there. That's at the pinch point. Exactly. That's, that's to the north up here. Um, so this is a steep hillside. This is a relatively steep hillside that leads up to, you know, um, West Barter Milk Road in this key area. Um, th these areas are essentially flat, though. And you can see the topo line, so they spread out. I guess I'm wondering what is the visibility from the lower valley floor of this new site? I think that's why the original one single site was selected. That's a really good question. And that is one of the drawbacks of this application in that um, we don't have the purview of site plan review at this time. And as I said before, there is no requirement for a site plan review. But if we, if we did have that, we could ask the applicant to put up story polls and show what a new house house would look like on the subject lot okay um let me ask a kind of broader question um that has struck me um you use the phrase that the totality of the two lots would be appropriate for subdivision even though one will be substandard to the uh, 10 acres it seems almost like we're bending over backwards to create new growth 
and setting this precedent that, you know, you could have some badly <clears throat> configured uh, land and uh, we'll, we'll let you get three homes here by counting all this way over here. And it's almost feels like the type of subdivisions we we find with the 35 acre subdivision where, you know, they're all coming off of a spoke and, and this and that and, and done under state review as opposed to what we would do if we were subdividing property. And so, um, I mean, I feel like we're setting a precedent that tells anyone if you have 22 acres in a 10 acre zone, please come in and ask for a planned unit development and we'll subdivide your land for you uh, regardless of of other activities. I mean, I, I'm looking at this and thinking that if there was a subdivision to attempt two lots or three lots per 37 acres, um, anything that goes off to that further side would probably be a non-conforming TDR type of, of site that, you know, if it was already subdivided because of the wildlife concerns and things like that, where we might say, hey, no development should occur on this farther end. Uh, you know, we'll offer you transfer of development rights, but it, it just wouldn't really conform both to the scenic areas, the uh, desires of the WAMP, and and our own code. So I'm a little concerned that we're setting a precedent that says, hey, if, if you have half an acre more than what you could subdivide within your zoning, please come in, we'll, we'll do a planned unit development for you and we'll let one lot be non-conforming and the other conforming. And, you know, it seems like a very, very much of a pro-growth mechanism to go to a PUD. And I, I, I don't find that to be consistent with our philosophy. And uh, similar to George's question, you know, really I'm looking at 5750 as being a baseline as appropriate that was by right of what we felt was appropriate for um, new growth. And uh, this seems to have um, been adopted to say, okay, we well, can have what everything on Upper Buttermilk has at 10,000, 15,000 square feet, but this was originally part of a ranch. It, it was not the Buttermilk subdivision. And so I don't know that, I don't feel that applying the, the up to 15,000 square foot standard is appropriate. And I, it seems probably like the right time to say it, but as you, everyone going through the memo probably has observed, I was uh, mayor at the time and signed the document for what was supposed to be a conservation easement uh, on the majority of this land with just the one building site. And so um, based on your reading, uh, apparently the legals uh, departments of the city did not get it right and didn't record it in the appropriate manner that um, it uh, withstood court challenge. Um, and, you know, I can accept that mistakes get made and we are where we are now. So it, now we're looking at what the county code applies to this. But I'm still seeing this question in my mind of why anticipate uh, additional growth beyond 5750 without TDRs and secondly why um, why set up a precedent that you know will help you subdivide your land into very irregular lots if you have enough acreage by doing a PUD and then we'll just count the totality of your of your parcel so I, I just struggle with those issues uh, related to our code and our growth now. I know we're having a work session coming up with uh, planning and zoning, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see us look to GMQS to be changed that it, it can allocate more than 5750 um, as a base, and, and the people can pursue TDRs or things like that if it's appropriate to the neighborhood. And, and, just, and just to tag on, Rachel, I mean, <laughs> even though the city uh, failed to record that that covenant we know what the intent was yeah i mean the wildlife report and things that was we know what the intent was yeah um so those are just general comments i understand um questions yes rachel's points are well made um in my mind though the way our land use code is written now we do have gmqs and gmqs allows what has been allowed here we do allow for for plan unit developments to do these but i think the one thing important for me is that it's really up, and clarify me if I'm wrong, 
It's, mm -hmm. it's really up to the board's discretion to rezone or not to rezone. And to me, that's a black and white issue here. And so taking into light what, what Rachel has said, looking at, and I know that, that Mitch is probably going to have a lot more for us, but looking at the lot that's being carved off, lot two, its location, its topography, it's act, you know right in the loop of the road, its visual view plane, all that stuff. The lot itself, because we don't have the specific activity envelope or conceptual before us, that's a bigger question for me right now, is, is rezoning appropriate or not? Yeah. Any um, any other specific questions for Mike to clarify uh, the staff's presentation before we move on to Mitch? Um, you know, I have one more question, um, Mike. If given that the lot size proposed is 5.3 acres, does that 5.3 acres determine a maximum house size that could be built on it? If we Looking at the land use code and ignoring the PUD and the requests, is there is, is there a size that that would determine that would be appropriate for that lot? Well, uh, appropriateness aside, because we don't have a site plan review, if this was a legal lot that was already created and retained a development right, the zoning in the zone district uh, it could be built up to 15,000 square feet with TDRs or growth management after 5750. Um, and that's not the request obviously here today. They are only requesting 10,750 square feet and that will be the maximum for this lot then. So it would be 15,000 because it's in the... UGB. It's close to Aspen in the urban growth boundary or... Well actually AR10, the agricultural residential 10 acre zone district that applies to this lot allows for development up to 15,000 square feet. Okay and does the fact that the road runs through it <laughs> and takes away a lot of the usable acreage on that lot, does that change anything? Um, it does because the applicant will propose development west of the road. So if I if I point behind you here with the with the pointer, Mitch's activity envelope will essentially be in this area right here. The rest of the lot, which includes Buttermilk Road and this little switchback area, will not be part of the of the development. It does not affect floor area the the, the road. You can still put it in uh, because AR10 is a zone district that does not have a floor area ratio. It's not a ratio of lot size to floor area. Too it's just 15,000 max. Okay, and the fact that the road runs through wouldn't affect the size of house that's allowed? No. Okay. No. Thank you. I'm just interested in your map. The, the shading is, represents the east-facing slope. Is yes. That where the, ridge, the ridge line follows that, that edge of the uh, the shading. Is that more or less? Where we are with the, the dry I'm just trying to get a sense yeah. of the view. Cause I, yeah, more or less. Yeah. better. Yes. That's yeah, right. I think... Uh, <laughs> Greg, I think that, yeah, you can see the topo line right here. But basically the ridge ridge runs like this. Right about there. Okay. And then that the lot itself, Shading to me, is a, I, I know that stretch of road and the switchbacks so well, the bow knot there. And to me, that is such a highly visible area. This is going to be visible to everybody in the valley coming and going on this road or across. <laughs> this, is a, this isn't a very discreet location, is it? Um, and it, it does seem like it, you know, the whole thing's a, it's a surprise that, that things turn out this way. I'm <laughs> trying to get a grip on, on, on how this happened, personally. Um, where's the access to the, the lot going to be from? Um, access would be taken after um, vehicles drive up West Buttermilk, and access would be taken from this side to this portion of the lot. Got it. Okay, if there's no other questions for Mike at this point, we always come back. Uh, Mitch, you want to make your presentation? Uh, sure, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon again. Um, I guess for the record, I should say to uh, Mitch Haas with Haas Land Planning, representing uh, 501 Buttermilk LLC, uh, who the owners of which are um, Brian and Emily Kiln. Uh, I'll pull it and see if I can get this operating okay I don't know how to do anything on a PC anymore so mm. bear with me good job I'm a Mac person now uh, so let's see I I guess I'll 
I could run through some of that history first before going through the whole proposal or vice versa. Maybe it's better to go through some of that history back again, just not not to reiterate so much what Mike said, but more just to uh, cover some of the details. Let's follow me. Bear with me a second. It's moving slowly. Okay. Okay. So the parcel, as we know, is owned by the city of Aspen uh, back until October of 2001. Uh, the city sold the property to the Williamses, James and Jill Williams, who were also Mass Development LLC. Uh, they, the Williams, were the applicants for that 2009 application. Uh, I was not involved in any of this until the current applicant purchased the property. Uh, so then from there, it was then sold from the Williams after that whole legal dispute and uh, court decree. It was sold to a different ownership, T, uh, the, the Prasuti family, uh, who then owned the property for a few years before selling it to my client, who took ownership of this property in October of 2015. Under the city's ownership from 1999 till 2002, the city pursued and obtained five separate development land use approvals from Pitkin County. Also, record, all of which were recorded. They also recorded a survey map of the property and a 1041 site plan of the property. Not one of these approvals, not one of these recorded documents had any mention whatsoever of a conservation easement or any kind of prohibition against subdivision. The conservation easement and an amendment thereto uh, were recorded by the city, but did not contain a legal description of the property that it burdened, uh, and indeed didn't describe any real property. The lack of the legal description resulted in the conservation easement not being discovered when the title search was completed prior to mass development's acquisition of the property. In other words, when they bought the property, their title policy did not include an exception for a conservation easement. The city conveyed the parcel to mass development by a warranty deed stated on the warranty deed that the property was free and clear of all former and other grants, bargains, sales, liens, taxes, assessments, encumbrances, and restrictions except for those listed or specifically listed on Exhibit 1 to that warranty deed. There's no mention on that warranty deed's Exhibit 1 of a conservation easement or any type of prohibition against subdivision on the property. The buyer then pursued and purchased the property uh, based on the record completely unaware of the conservation easement or the possibility of any such encumbrances or prohibition against subdivision burdening the property. Later from there, though, that buyer in 2008 to 2009 had applied for a growth management application and a similar subdivision. Uh, their application failed to score the minimum threshold by it with the Planning and Zoning Commission. They then appealed that scoring to the Board of County Commissioners. The appeal was denied on a finding that the PNZ did not make a demonstrable error, denied due process, or abuse its discretion in rendering its scoring. These decisions were not based on the conservation easement issue. Later after that, given that the conservation easement had surfaced as an issue, become a problem for those owners, uh, they, based on not having anything in their title policy, uh, were engaged in a lawsuit against the Aspen Oak Homeowners Association. The result of that lawsuit was a decree recorded uh, with the county records on July 8th of 2011 finding that the deed of conservation easement was of no legal force in effect and did not encumber the property and the title quieted to the williams was quieted to the williams free and clear of any right title or interest uh, of any defendant in the action uh, and the defendants were enjoined from asserting any claims to the williams property arising from or before arising before the date of the decree in other words, no conservation easement, and it should no longer be a debate or an issue moving forward. 
The property was then sold to a different owner in 2011, approximately four months after the decree. Uh, no conservation easement or prohibition against subdivision was included in that sale either. Uh, and a fourth owner now is my client or the applicant before you uh, who purchased the property without any such restrictions. So that brings us to going forward, you know, um, I'll, I'll describe the proposal more. Sorry, I got to go backwards since I had that all at the end for some no good reason. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. So we, we went over the parcel. I just want to go a little more on the context if I can. Uh, again, that's the whole parcel. This is all open space owned by the city of Aspen with AVLT having a conservation easement on it. More open space owned by the city of Aspen. Uh, these are the Aspen Oak lots that back up to the property. Along here is all a ridge line. So this all slopes up, up, up to this ridge line. That is the water line cut that's visible uh, and everyone's familiar with, I think. Um, there is a new develop, relatively new development, a house that was built right over here, uh, Linda Bedell's place. Um, and our new lot would sit in this area right next to, clustered with the existing house there. Um, and we've made some changes in the application along the way, uh, one to address concerns raised by this neighbor, another to address or try to address concerns of this neighbor here as well. Uh, and as well as some other changes to try to address concerns of the Metro District Water Service. And I'll go through those in just a sec. So again, the property is 37 acres. Um, there's an existing single family home, the zone district's AR10, uh, which has a minimum lot area of only 10 acres. Uh, so the property maintains a potential, subject to review, code requirements, et cetera, to be subdivided into three lots. Uh, we decided on applying for approvals to split the parcel into a total of two lots only, uh, such that lot one would contain the existing home and the associated improvements with it. Um, it's a 31.74 acre lot, of which 26.6 acres would be placed in a conservation easement covering all of the valued open space on the parcel. And that is how the Planning and Zoning Commission scored the application, that all valued open space is being preserved. Um, and the conservation easement, will, as we've stated, will be granted uh, and run to the benefit of Picking County open space and trails. Lot two is the new vacant lot, has a total area of 5.34 acres uh, with an activity envelope of 1.1 acres. Uh, within which all development activity would be contained or confined uh, and be appropriately clustered adjacent to the development on lot one. Here's a little map of this all. Uh, this line here, the water line runs right down the hill here. Uh, at this pinch point, everything to the north is in the 26.6 acres that would be in the conservation easement. Um, Lot two would be this piece here. And what you're seeing otherwise is this area along the ridge line would be dedicated as a trail easement with no actual trail currently planned or to be developed, but for the potential in the future. Uh, and same with this whole area inside the switchback uh, and the road as there was thoughts of while we started this application, building a trail that would connect from Buttermilk Mountain across the switchbacks through this area and take a single track trail across here. That was actually considered to carry the trail all the way through the conservation easement and around the big knoll at the end to connect into Sky Park. Um, we County open space and trails representatives uh, and city open space representatives were actually, and, and Roaring Fork Mountain Bike Association, uh, IMBA, were all quite excited about the possibility of that trail. And we had entered the application process proposing it as much. Uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife reviewed it, 
was, uh, let's say, less than enamored with the idea of another trail here. Um, and AVLT did not want to amend their conservation easement below to allow what they considered a duplicate trail, given that the Butterline Trail was just approved and they had to amend their conservation easement for that. So we said, all right, we'll give up on that trail. Um, but we'd still like to grant the easements in case, who knows, 10, 20, 30, 50 years down the line, things change. If anyone would want to have a trail at that point, we would at least have provided the easements and it can be pursued. Um, so we're still going to provide those easements, but the trail through this property has gone away. And instead, the funds, the, the funds that were allocated in growth management, $35,000, uh, was not a random number, but was a number that was um, estimated by Roaring Fork Mountain Bike Association as what it would cost to have built this trail. Uh, so we took the same funds and said, instead, we will allocate it to a trail that uh, the City of Aspen Open Space Department and Roaring Fork Mountain Bike Association are now pursuing down the front side of Buttermilk Mountain uh, that would provide single track connections all the way from the city of Aspen to Sky Mountain Park, which of course provides single track connections up into the town of Snowmass Village and vice versa. So, <clears throat> and apparently Pickin County Open Space and Trails also supports that trail being built because uh, a letter was issued today to that extent, to that uh, extent to that effect uh, to the ski company saying that open space and trail supports the trail as well. And I'll show you more about that trail uh, in a slide or two. So this is just a little bit of a blow up of the same map we were just looking at, uh, attempting to blow it up to be a little more visible. So the activity envelope and more of the lot for lot two, so you can see the lot two boundary comes around across and all of that. The activity envelope is this area down here at the very bottom. It does sit in a depression. These topo lines are going down before these go back up the steep hillside. Um, this ridge line, it's our belief that this ridge line uh, and the depression that this sits in will allow this home to be adequately screened from Highway 82. The home that sits above us up here is fully visible. This home's not visible. The Bedell home that was built over here is partially visible because it sits at higher ground and the site drops, her site drops off down there. This one we don't believe will be particularly visible, uh, but again, that will be not only determined but required with a site plan review and the scenic review that goes with it. While it would have been nice to have a site plan review at this point, it would have been crazy of my client to design a house for this lot already. Uh, one, he doesn't have a lot. Two, he doesn't know, he didn't know at the time what kind of square footage might or might not be allowed. Um, and to hire an architect to design a house, hoping for all of that would be crazy, really. Uh, so that's the only reason you don't have that now, and nobody in their right mind would have proposed a home yet. Uh, what we did propose is a square footage uh, that when we heard concerns at our initial planning and zoning commission of that square footage and the potential mass of it, we refined the design to commit to uh, a substantial percentage of that being uh, only allowed below grade. Oh, and also with this envelope, the neighbor up above was concerned that a home built here might infringe on his views out across the uh, upper valley. And we agreed to limit the height here such that nothing would project if you took a certain elevation line up in here and carried it straight across an imaginary plane, nothing would project above that from this home so as not to infringe upon his views. So the basics of the proposal, uh, only two lots where the zoning permits a development potential or density of up to th of three lots. A guarantee going forward of no further subdivision or potential for a third lot or home. Siting of the proposed activity envelope on lot two at the lowest elevation available so as to avoid compromising others' views, others' views 
and to confine the lot's development, including its driveway, septic, et cetera, to within a 1.1 acre area. The development's appropriately clustered to assure compatibility and avoid valued open space on the property. Uh, the zoning allows development of up to 15,000 square feet on lot two, but our growth management approval establishes a maximum of 10,750 square feet with no more than 8,250 uh, being above grade. So no more than 55% of the potential under zoning being located above grade. Uh, further, we agreed to limiting the building height, as I just mentioned, uh, such that no ridge or portion would project above the 8,095 foot elevation. Uh, that was to address a neighbor's concerns with views over the property. In addition, we've been trying throughout this process, every time we hear a concern from a neighbor, to respond in a way that hopefully addresses that concern, uh, or at least begins to, as best we can. Uh, so what we've also included in this application are commitments to investing and enhancing the landscaping of lot one to better fit into the neighborhood. Uh, that has already begun with additional screening in the front part of the property. Uh, with that landscaping was funding and implementation of a revegetation and protection of the wildlife habitat over several acres of lot one that were left damaged during the previous owner's construction of the, of the residence, largely in the area adjacent to Julian Gregory. So if I back up again, I'll show you where we're talking about. So this whole hillside below the ridge line, uh, so the west facing side below the ridge line, was left very much scarred, uh, all weeds, very little vegetation. Uh, my client is committed to revegetating that area with native species and controlling all of the weeds in the area and eliminating that whole scarred look, um, which all the neighbors, a lot of the neighbors over in Aspen Oak uh, have had to look at for several years now. Uh, in addition, with that, the whole scarred area um, removed a good deal of sagebrush and left in its place mainly thistle and noxious <laughs> weeds. Uh, so we've begun a comprehensive weed and thistle management program on the property. It's already been underway uh, and revegetating all that scar with appropriate native species to restore the habitat value. Mind you that these commitments were not needed to score in the growth management. They were things that we had proposed as bonus scoring in the case that there was a competition and you needed bonus points, all of that goes away when there wasn't a competition, but we said we'll keep it in there anyway because it was in good faith we had proposed it uh, and we meant to make those commitments and those improvements for the neighborhood. So we are still committed to those even though they were not needed for the scoring. Community-wide, um, of course, 26.6 acre conservation easement adjacent to 50 plus acres of conservation easement is a benefit that everyone gets to enjoy, um, including wildlife. Uh, easements across both lots to accommodate the potential for future trial connections should that ever be desired. Uh, and funding for trials development on Buttermilk Mountain to provide what are the final links connecting Aspen to Sky Mountain Park to the town of Snowmass Village and vice versa. And in the event that the county should not approve a amendment, a minor amendment to the Buttermilk Mountain Master Plan to allow that trail, uh, we've already stated that, that those funds will be reallocated to be used by Pickin County for maintenance and improvements in Sky Mountain Park. So where is that trail? Uh, this is the current proposed alignment down Buttermilk, it's the blue trail. So right now, uh, if you're a mountain biker, you leave the city of Aspen, you go over the 7th Street Bridge, uh, and then there are trails that cut through the Maralt open space and the Moore open space, bringing you to the bridge to Tyhack. You go up Tyhack, you get on this Oregon trail and you're right across Buttermilk from the Tyhack side to the front side of Buttermilk on the Oregon Trail. And today what happens is 
you end up having to come down the steep buttermilk road, which is steep and loose gravel and not much fun for a mountain biker, uh, and something very, very few mountain bikers will do in reverse. Very few people will go up here to go back the other way. So the, you end up on the roads or the Rio Grande Trail. This link is being drawn up by Roaring Fork Mountain Bike Association uh, and is going to be, the, they with the City of Aspen Open Space are working with the ski company right now on a, lease, a license agreement to allow this trail to be built. And it avoids the half pipe or super pipe um, and brings a single track trail current like the ones in Sky Park, uh, built at a less than 12% grade, uh, easily manageable up or down. And what that will do is bring a rider down to here where you can easily get back across to the Butterline Trail right here. Can I ask a quick question? Yep. Is that bottom half of that trail going down the front of Buttermilk, is that on in Picking County? Is that Picking County? It's in Picking County on well, Aspen Skiing Company property. You have to come back to us for approval at some point? Right. So it's been, there's a pre-application conference summary prepared already uh, okay. for a minor amendment to the Buttermilk master, master plan. plan. Um, I don't know if minor amendment has to come back to the commissioners or if it's a staff level. No, I don't no, no. remember. It depends if staff kicks it um, up to us. They could. It, staff it's, usually kicks those things up to us. It's one of those everybody seems to be hoping to see happen. So I, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, so we, that, the application hasn't been done yet because the license agreement hasn't okay. been worked out yet. So permission from the ski company doesn't formally exist. And that's why the letter was generated today from Picken County Open Space to the ski company to show support for that. Um, Which we have ski company yet. had requested that. So that's so that's where the funds will go. And just as a total aside, because I personally want to see this happen, I've committed my time free of charge to doing working on that application uh, and hopefully getting it approved. <laughs> So with the issues that had come up with water service, uh, my, my client committed to quite a few things that are above and beyond any other requirement uh, associated with other people in the Buttermilk Metro District. Uh, the first one, of course, everybody in the Metro District has to pay tap fees and road maintenance costs for anything in their area. But the rest of these are things we committed to because we want to do the right thing. Um, first is foregoing the rights to an existing well that sits on what is proposed lot two uh, and a willingness to donate those well water rights to the Metro District. Uh, in our first hearing at Planning and Zoning Commission, Julie and Gregory had mentioned that in the past, whenever that well was used at all uh, or water drawn from it, his well stopped producing enough water uh, on his property and caused problems for him. So we said, well, we don't want to use the well either. We want to use water from the metro district and just have a tap. Um, and what we would do then is preclude the use of that well, even for irrigation or anything else, by donating the water, capping the well, and donating the water rights. Uh, we've also gone forward and told the metro district we will prohibit swimming pools on lot two, uh, as those consume quite a bit of water. We've committed to installing water conservation plumbing fixtures throughout the new residence uh, and committed to establishing with the Metro District irrigation restrictions suitable to the community for this property and only allowing the installation of drought tolerant, low water requiring landscaping or xeriscaping on the lot. None of those requirements apply to anybody else in the West Buttermilk Metro District, but will apply to this property. So I thought this was relevant to put up the scoring, even though the scoring is done, because what it speaks to is a finding by staff and the Planning and Zoning Commission that the proposal complies with all county requirements relative to these criteria. In other words, to score the base requirement in fire protection, you have to be found to comply with all fire protection requirements in the county code. To score above the base requirement, you would have had to have addressed a need in the surrounding area. So in the fire protection, using that one as an example, 
we got a score of one. So that means we comply with all requirements. The same can be said with the road system, comply with all road traffic transportation requirements. With transit and trails, we scored the maximum uh, with the commitments for the easements and for the funding of the trail across Buttermilk and providing the last link in the single track connections. So that means we've exceeded the county requirements with regard to transit and trails. With regard to water resources, we were given the score of two, meaning we comply with the county's requirements. I would still argue it wasn't necessary to argue because we meet, achieved the minimum threshold, so we said, fine, we don't need to argue over it. But the commitments we've made exceed the county's requirements and do help to address needs in the surrounding area by lowering our water consumption relative to what it could be from the metro district and by addressing the needs of our neighbor and Julian Gregory by capping and closing that well. Uh, that, ex that addresses surrounding needs as well. With wildlife habitat, we've took all, we've taken all habitat and protected it, put it in a conservation easement. So we scored the maximum there. Uh, pro open space preservation, we scored the maximum because quote unquote all valued open space on the property was found to be preserved and protected with the conservation easement. Uh, and hazard mitigation, we simply avoided all hazards. There's no slopes over 30% in the envelope. There's the wildfires low, um, no geologic hazards known, et cetera. No floodplains. Um, so by avoiding all, we scored the maximum there. So the point of this is to show that we, we've either met county requirements in every regard or exceeded them um, in, with regard to these considerations. Uh, a little about the PUD portion. The PUD portion, the only reason we've asked for a PUD is because obviously we can meet the 10 acre minimum requirement per lot in this property. Uh, we have 37 acres and two lots. We have an average lot size of 18 and a half acres, which well in excess of the 10 acre minimum. It's a common tool in subdivisions in Pitkin County. There's no we're not creating precedent, we're following precedent. Uh, it's a common tool that we use the PUD to allow smaller lot sizes because that allows development to be appropriately clustered. If we made each lot 10 acres, the development sites would be spread further apart. Or we'd be forced to do one of those weird lot lines like you've seen in those old 35 acres. We'd have to create a meandering or flagpole lot to get the area from up here to count for a lot down there, which I know from experience drives everybody crazy and no one ever wants to see that happen. So what we've done on other subdivisions in the county, uh, lots of examples, uh, all the ones I know Sonny Van worked on for a lot of years, uh, the ones I've worked on, like the Roaring Fork Meadows, for instance, uh, we've, we've usually used an average lot area so as to best cluster development and best preserve open space. And that's the reason we've done that here. Um, could I have proposed a meandering lot line that made this lot area 10 acres and avoided the need to request a rezoning for a PUD? Of course I could have. Um, in fact, it'd be easy to. But this is a better, more eloquent solution uh, to addressing the county's land use policies and goals. And that allows us to put this home site right next to the existing home site and closest to the home sites above us and next to us on the other side uh, where Linda Bedell's property has been developed. So that's the reason for that. Um, and in a rezoning, yes, you have to show that there's been changed conditions, et cetera. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of changed conditions over time with this property given the history from the where the city of Aspen owned it through four owners later and lawsuits and findings that have gone on with all of those things uh, and development of properties around us as well. Uh, so again, all of that just leads back to providing a better plan where we can cluster development tightly or as closely to get as, together as reasonably possible um, and avoid development in habitat areas 
hazard areas, um, scenic areas. Uh, I think that covers everything. The only other um, question was again about the visibility from 82, which that requirement's not going away, and we, we know eventually the development on this lot will be subject to scenic review. At that point, when something's designed and we know what we're talking about, we would put up story poles, do all the visual analysis necessary, um, and go through that process, just like all the homes around have had to do. A couple of little things, Mitch, um, that I noted in your presentation, and you always seem to, um, uh, not to be disrespectful, to sort of embellish on some of these gifts or benefits. So, for example, when you said that the uh, the applicant is already working on improving the habitat of those 26 acres, uh, reducing the uh, the thistle and the weeds, well, they haven't got a choice. By by law, they have to take care of their weeds on their property. So that's really not a benefit, right? That's required by law. Right, but the last two owners didn't do any of that. Well, but it's by, it's just required by law. Okay. Well, it's, so it's not a benefit. It's I'm, a just saying, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. The other thing is on on the point score. The, the point scores uh, the GMQS got. Uh, they they gave uh, four points, which is a good chunk for transit and trail. What I'm hearing is that um, the applicant, in terms of contributing to the trail, is thirty-five thousand dollars. Correct. Yeah. So Any for me, for me, in terms of the larger picture, uh, that's a drop in a bucket, frankly. That'd that be my comment as well. That'd be my comment on that. So those are just two little, little points I, I just picked up from that. Rachel. Well, that's a good point, Georgia. Um, especially considering Colorado Parks and Wildlife has kind of said, don't do that trail. Uh, it would <coughs> fracture the wildlife further and you already have the butter line trail. So, you know, I don't know why getting a four would have counted when Parks and Wildlife has kind of advised not doing a trail there. Um, and if that did not get a four, this would not have made threshold. Um, so there is that, but, you know, we have looked at the scores already. <coughs> I guess my questions might be a little more for um, Mike at this time, kind of going backwards. Uh, I've heard two different terms used. One is scenic review and one is site plan review. Are those two separate reviews or different names for the same review? Site plan review incorporates scenic review. Okay. And uh, will that come to our board or does that happen uh, at a staff level or planning and zoning level? That happens at a, if the subdivision would get approved, that would happen at a staff level unless the Board of County Commissioners re requested to see it. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that overall there's um, kind of lipstick on a pig maybe coming from both sides of this, you know, of, of well, how do, we, how do we work with what we have? What, what is been the determinations uh, of the courts and um, everything else? Um, but for me, if this lot were to go forward, it really is just, just simply too much building on a really small, what we would be creating as a non-conforming lot. You know, although I understand the reasons that you've just said about, you know, uh, using the PUD that way. A at the end of the day, the lot is still pretty small and it's highly visible location. And I'm afraid uh, or concerned that our board wouldn't get a chance to weigh in on what is the appropriate size of that residence, regardless of what the GMQS allotment was. And, you know, I voted to accept the GMQS allotment by the PNZ. Uh, that's their work. That's their purview. Um, I didn't see grounds to, quote, reject it. But I think that uh, without having a further ability to look at the site, the house, the scenic review, and to determine what is the really appropriate size, I tend to trend more towards the 5750 uh, kind of standard base home. And this is uh, almost a, a gift in that it's uh, gone through this chain of ownership, though, but to create a lot that's in a uh, 
desirable community, a desirable neighborhood, uh, easy access to town or to Snowmass, uh, that, that 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 should be enough without having to say that this is is going to be uh, uh, I, I think no matter what you try to do with 8200 square feet above ground on this location it's going to be an eyesore and uh, highly visible from highway 82 and so I just have hesitancy of going forward with without having that ability to check in or to appropriately limit the, the house size. Um, it really reminds me of that parcel that we dealt with um, off and on over the years. You may remember Patty or others uh, in the, um, not the old snowmass area, old snowmass area, the little teeny triangle, uh, a non-conforming lot. And no, it didn't get to be 5750 even. It got to be like 32 or, or 28 it or something. What is it? 1700. And smaller and smaller. Smaller and smaller to be a, a appropriate size for a non conforming lot. So I guess that's the dilemma I'm really feeling uh, of, um, you know, I, I don't want to turn this loose and, you know, have it have it been uh, further approved at 8200 and and well we'll just live with a little this and a little that because you live with it forever and I, I think that this is just uh, 15 pounds in a 10 pound bag Can I, just add? I know that we probably have other questions but before I really make any statements I'd really like to hear from the public yeah we will I just, uh, yeah, I just want, I, I want to uh, I don't have any questions. Uh, yeah, I just want to see if there's any questions for uh, for the applicant. Well, notice. that's why I was asking about site plan review. So oh. we could ask that it be Brought kicked to, to this board uh, for scenic review, site plan review combo. And uh, at that time, we could set the appropriate house size. Is that Would that also be in our purview if it comes back to us? I think uh, that would be problematic um, and I think we'd probably have to discuss the process for that um, and my thinking behind that Rachel is that um, the allocation for 10,750 square feet has already been uh, approved so um, if there was going to be a reduction in that I think that um, we'd probably have to go back through a process with the P&Z uh, being part of that and we'd also have to uh, Ask Mitch if his client would be willing to do something like that in order to gain subdivision approval. Can, can I question? I'm not sure. Past history, I'm looking at Suzanne, with the complexity of GMQS scoring, only once can I remember when we reconsidered it and brought it back to the BOCC for GMQS rescoring. And that was before we had moved it on with our approval. As part of our giving P and Z a nod, which we didn't, we brought it back to be rescored. Do you remember, Suzanne? I, th I think the rescoring you might be thinking of goes back as far as the stage three theaters. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. So then a different scenario, and and I can't, I don't think I can put, was Roaring Fork Meadows when they added the Barda parcel into it and subdivided, got an allotment. The board did grant a smaller allotment than was originally proposed by the applicant. I would have to go back and look yeah, at the I'm circumstances. Yeah, I'm not sure what our of, opportunities are. Right, like at what point in the process that happened. Um, but I do believe they had asked for 8250, and then were only granted 5750. Yeah, so that the yeah. end. But I don't know I where that right. tied into the process. So we could get that information to you. But yeah. that's the only one that I'm thinking of on yeah, the top I'm, of I'm my not, head. Necessary. Sure. I don't think I'm going there. I was just trying to clarify it for yeah. others. Yeah, yeah I really and that wasn't that. a, a rescoring. We did have one rescoring. It was in association was... with the subdivision approval, I believe, that the allotment was reduced. It was a rescoring when Shelley was on the board with us. I remember that. <laughs> but let me let me ask another question while Suzanne's at the mic yeah. <laughs> before you sit back down. Um, at, at a staff level, if you were doing the scenic review and site plan review and continued to have visual issues from Highway 82 or others areas, would you be forced to just keep kind of reconfiguring the 10,002 or the 8,200 above ground and until you got as 
close as you could get, but you would, at a staff level, you'd have no ability to say, oh, this should really only be 7,800 instead of 82. I mean, wh what power do you have at the site plan scenic review at a staff level? For us to limit floor, well, we, we could not limit floor area at an administrative level. That would have to, we would have to bring it up to the BOCC at that point. You know, so then the question is through the scenic standards, you know, would there be, you know, would we be saying we, we would deny it? I mean, really, for us, you know, usually, you know, the, the biggest issue is, is it breaking a ridge line? Which, you know, there's some funky pieces out there in buttermilk that from interesting angles, you know, I don't one. know if that could be an issue here or not. But, but that's, you know, usually sort of that first piece, you know, put up height poles and see. If that's not the issue, then in terms of we're going to see another house on, you know, up in that West Buttermilk area, you know, you know, usually we're looking at how do you minimize, not necessarily size, but how do you minimize those, those visual impacts? And we look, you know, more broadly, obviously you see houses when you look up at West Buttermilk from the highway. So we have to put it in that context as, you know, well, okay, if it's not going to break a ridge line, if we've checked that, you know, piece off, then then how do we work with that? How do you minimize it? You know, is it massing? Is it, but if, if it got to the point where we said, boy, you know, there's just no way to somehow make that much, you know, 10, 750 work, the only way there could be a reduction in that would be if we brought it up to the BOCC. And how do you bring it up to the BOCC? I mean, we're back to this process question, I think. Yeah, that I might think that, I mean, the, I, I think, I believe the, there's lang the language in the code and, and I really, I, it speaks to an administrative adjustment or something and it basically says at site plan something like that could only be approved by the BOCC so if there was to be a reduction in square in floor area as a part of a site plan we could not do it we would automatically you could recommend send it, it to the BOCC you would recommend it to the BOCC that in evaluating this we've looked at this and this is kind of where it starts to become acceptable we would make some recommendation. I mean, at that point, we would say it's we're taking it out of our approval realm. We will take it to the BOCC, and then, like with anything else, we would make our recommendation based on our analysis of the code and the, the standards in the code. Okay. But that comes back to the fundamental question. Since the 10750 has been approved by GMQS allotment, can it come back to the Board of Commissioners for reduction in size? And all I can say there is, I, I I know it happened once in the past, and I would have to we would have to come back to you know sort of go back through how did how did we get there in that yeah, process. Yeah, so maybe that's a question we need can, to have answered before we can move forward. I, I would yeah. acknowledge that potential because, frankly, a, a lot that's allowed fifty seven fifty, by right, under zoning, it's the same thing. A person has that development right of fifty seven fifty. If it goes through scenic review and you find that it's breaking a ridge line or, or isn't complying with the standards and there is a provision in the code to reduce the allowable size to f make it comply. Um, excuse me, mm -hmm. Ryan, I want to ask our, our attorney whether you're up to speed on this enough to be able to respond to the questions regarding uh, GMQS, the PNZ's purview, and our ability to, to uh, override that. George, off the top of my head, I can't answer that for you right now, but I can certainly uh, make an effort and make sure that we get an answer for you before this comes before you guys again. Uh, that's okay. the most I can do to help you right George, now. George, not to try to substitute for what Rye will tell you, but, but, but in addition, I would acknowledge that the, the growth management allotment says you have up to this much square footage that you're allowed to build that the subdivision approval is still subject to site plan review, which includes a scenic review, uh, which is, again, applicable from Highway 82 and Owl Creek Road for this property. And being that the approval is subject to that down the line, then that brings with it all of what could happen with a site plan review. And it's totally, it's clearly stated in the code, in site plan review, your square footage can be limited if, well, well thank necessary. you for that, but I'll, I think I'll, I'll wait to hear from our attorney's office. Of course. Like I said, not a substitute, but just uh, so I, I, hear, I have the code section in front of me. So 
The it's provision is adjustment of range size or intensity of proposed activity or development. This is not answering the question about reducing a growth management allotment. That's the question I it's have. It's more the question about the site plan and, and reducing size. Um, the community if the community development department terms proposed development can only occur in compliance with the code and the comp plan if the maximum structure size is reduced to less than 5750, application shall automatically be converted to one step for BOCC. Mm -hmm. The scenic view protection standards of the code shall not be utilized to reduce the maximum gross flurry of permitted development to less than 5750. So basically, this was related to constraints. Where if we had a lot in front of us, you know, at 5750, and we said, "Boy, it's right. that lot on Snowmass <coughs> Creek Road." Right. You know, the only way you could do it is at 1500 square feet. We could not make that decision. It would come to you. But again, that's related to constraints. So well, that's that, a different. Can I, I just want to add to that real quick? My concern about square footage limitation does really not apply to scenic review. I think that there may be an opportunity for, in my opinion, that I feel that there's smaller square footage required or appropriate on that lot, regardless of scenic review or breaking a ridge line. So that's a question that would come back to reducing the allotment per GMQS, flat out, if that's allowed by the BOCC. That's my legal question. Okay, let's move on from there. Uh, any other questions for the applicant? Uh, Greg? Just, well, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm still confused by what I see here. And, uh, I'm looking at page 67 on my, I'm not sure how that how that translates to other pages. If you had paper, we could go right know, If I had pages, I could go, <laughs> sorry, I just lost it here. But what, the, what it, I'm seeing is it says that the CPW says it's completely inappropriate to have wildlife on this proposed trail. Yet staff has said, well, we can put the proposed trail in knowing that we're never going to build this or we're not going to build this for the time being. And, and then if we ever decide we want to build it, we can come back later and see if CPW has changed their mind. And I don't understand that, and I think it's, it doesn't, I don't understand how you can get points for something that has been pretty much turned down com by the, the, the wildlife department, saying, well, we're still going to put in for this trail and get points for it. Somebody's got to explain that to me. Uh, that may be, uh, I mean, that's a question for staff, how and how that discussion went with P&Z. It goes back to the GMQ scoring, which yeah. we already approved. Right. But that is my uh, I, I can, I can answer that if it helps, Greg. Um, sure, please. Part of the applicant's uh, request during GMQS and a way to score points is to dedicate public trail easements. Um, also, there's an opportunity to try and fund uh, other projects that, that a public organization like Open Space and Trails is doing um, so that you can score a point. But you're exactly right. Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, did say that uh, given where the Butterline Trail exists today and the fact that there's some valuable wildlife habitat where the conservation easement, at this time, a trail would not be appropriate. And, and staff acknowledged that in the report. Part of uh, what the application was during the GMQS P&Z process was that um, the trail easements would be dedicated, um, acknowledging that they would not be constructed without full CPW support and then also Aspen Valley Land Trust support who holds a conservation easement on the parcel to the east. Um, you're right, in, in 2017, the trail is not appropriate, but looking in the long term and acknowledging that there have to be multiple parties that agree to a construction of a trail, staff thought that um, platting the easement would be a benefit. Um, in addition to what was committed to with GMQS, there was money uh, associated with uh, the trail construction that Mitch was showing across Buttermilk Mountain. Um, and that was the, um, the one that kind of skirted the half pipe and then connected into the Butterline Trail. Um, there was funding provided for that. And if that did not come to fruition, um, the application then said that those funds would go into Sky Mountain Park um, uh, for trail maintenance and upkeep of, of that area. So it, it, it wasn't just the trail easement dedication. There was some additional uh, points scored with that. Bakshish. I, I think I'm going to open this up for public comment now. People have been waiting patiently all afternoon. So thank you very much. You just want to come up and identify yourself? Hi. My name is Joyce Amico. I'm here in two capacities. 
Um, and I'm really, I'm, I'm going to give you a history on a, a capacity as president of the Buttermilk Metropolitan District for 18 years. I have been privy and participatory on all of uh, the things that are cited from 1999 when uh, the Burlingame effect and this went into a, a conservation easement and where the city made a mistake and didn't record that, which is now where we arrive at this point. Um, I'm also uh, going to reference the fact uh, that I, I did attend every county commissioner meeting back then also and spoke about this in 2009 when this came up with the previous um, owner, Mr. Williams. Okay? And so from that, these, uh, this was always intended, and the reason why that lot was where that one house was uh, allowed, that was the building envelope right there. Everything else was uh, supposed to be entered into a conservation uh, con conservation easement, and so uh, we you talk about this ridge line with uh, this trail that goes directly past six homeowners' homes, <laughs> and uh, I could tell you every homeowner here is against that, um, and they may not be here right now, but who live there on Aspen Oak Drive. I have, uh, I created the Buttermilk Metropolitan District. I've served on that board for 18 years. I finally got someone to be president of that board, and I no longer, as of May, uh, am going to be the president, but I do still sit on the board. But we did get a letter. A, each board member uh, got a letter that uh, they were trying to make a uh, a meeting. They were trying to make a meeting so that they can come to you and say that the Buttermilk Metropolitan District gave this property proposal water. I'm I as a board member was against it because I wanted to take care of the district as we had planned the district, and how we had planned the district was based on the lots that were buildable, and that's how we did it. So you sent a letter. Uh, that basically implied legal action to the board of the Buttermilk Metropolitan District. And I was on vacation, and I was in a remote place. Um, my husband and I both serve on this board. We would be definitely against this building, but we definitely, uh, for, for a, a host of reasons, but there was an insistence on having this meeting. And my board went ahead and had the meeting, even though I asked to be part of this meeting. And I wasn't. And that is why I stepped down as president, because I, you know, my board didn't honor what I wanted to do. So they had this meeting. They basically determined that, yes, we do have water. Yes, we do have water, because we are now on city water. Okay? So, of course, we still do have water. But we wanted to take care of the homes within our district. We weren't in the business of selling new water, okay? But the board made that decision and provided uh, a letter that says, yes, we can provide water through the city, okay? Now, I'm going to take that hat off, <laughs> but I have participated in 2009 when they came to the county commissioners, the Williams, to try and subdivide that property again, and that time... We, I, we did oppose based on water because that was never included in our planning. And we weren't on city water then either, okay? So now I'm going to take off the other hat and talk about uh, the Aspen Oak Homeowners Association. We've, I've lived here for 24 years. And uh, when the, the Williams built that property, that was, I remember when that property became, it was a city property. It, it was to offset the cost of Burlingame. And it was uh, Mr. Gregory's here also who abutted that. And as a Buttermilk Metropolitan District then, we tried to help Mr. Gregory in providing as much information as we could and protection about that property being built. 
You make reference to saying that you've planted landscaping and you've taken care of, uh, you know, you've added more trees, and that's a visual. Be that, that beautifies the house that's there. They never had trees to isolate the house in front of it, and so recently they put those in. And it looks great. It looks great. They've done some great landscaping. That whole property looks awesome. I have two concerns from a resident who lives there. One is the size of the, the house they're proposing is a huge. There's no other house that size anywhere in the immediate vicinity other than the 7,500 uh, square foot house that is built right next to it. But every other house doesn't exceed 5,000 square feet in that area. Okay? Uh, an Aspen Oak Drive, nothing. And so um, we... That is a concern. When Linda Bedell came up and built her uh, her little house, and it, it's a smaller home on the opposite side next to Buttermilk Lane, that was a concern for me and on our metro district because it was a road cut, another road cut off of West Buttermilk Road. And there have been significant problems coming down in the winter from that area. And so I was concerned about that road cut. We, as, a dis, as the Buttermilk Metropolitan District, we had tried to uh, suggest maybe going down Buttermilk Lane. But because the fire department said they wouldn't be able to turn back and get into that house, we understood it and you made your decision and that's how that, that worked. I'd be concerned again about another road cut right within West Butter, uh, with Buttermilk Lane, Linda Bedell property, their, uh, the 501 uh, property, and then a fourth road cut for another property. So those in, in a turn... In an S turn, that's a problem. I uh, so as a resident of that area, I uh, have always seen this property as one property, and it's always been one property. We have this trail that you propose that you want to do. We have 33 elk that run through that property, through the backyard, through our backyards. It is all right there. We have deer, we have mountain lion, we have every animal that's out here is there. That trail would uh, definitely interfere with the wildlife that exists in our, in our neighborhood. And so I'm here speaking on behalf of everybody on Aspen Oak Drive saying, that no, they really aren't uh, happy to see a trail there. And um, as far as what your decision is of whether or not you grant permission to build this property or to, to subdivide this property, I, you know, why wasn't it able to be done for the Williams then? And why, you know, because it, it, it's just, you, it, the intent was there when the city gave this property that it was for one property only. Okay, and then the city was supposed to enter this into a conservation easement that protected the wildlife for its existence. And so that history is there. And that's all I have to say. Thanks, Joyce. Okay, sorry. Thank you very I'm much. A little Italian, you know. Good <laughs> well, thank you. Julian. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Julian Gregory, and my name has been up there enough. I might as well stand up and <laughs> put a face to the name. Um, I, I've got a few few issues. Some of them are short-term um, uh, concerns I have, and then I have one long-term concern to the um, to the property. First of all, I, I find it funny. It took about ten thousand square feet. Uh, my house is the one directly adjacent to this property and the one that was just developed right, right there, there thank you and um it's interesting uh i've got five thousand square feet and five kids and we've raised them all and five thousand feet uh, square feet is plenty so when you sit there and say ten thousand feet i don't know what i'd do with a house twice the size of mine probably get lost in it um anyway so i don't think it exactly fits in with the with the size and scope of of the neighborhood but that's um really uh sort of the, the short-term um, issue. Uh, it's also interesting that 
you know, the application says the owner wants to move here, live here, be full time. In our house, the Presuti family lived there, and they had kids our age, went to the same school, and it was actually a neighborhood. Uh, we know uh, Joyce and everybody down the road, but it's it was it's everybody sort of stays to their uh, stays to themselves. Um, so, since the Presutis have left uh, left and the new owners come in, I've really I think I've seen activity there twice, maybe three times, uh, which is interesting to me for somebody who wants to make their full time or, or or spend more time in the valley. So basically, to me, this is nothing but. Um, an outside developer coming in and it's a spec home. Um, you know, they can, we know what the intent, they can say what their intent is, but you know, this is a beautiful 7,500 square foot house. Um, this guy's going, no, I don't really want it. I want to build another one out here. And that way my view plane will be down towards Aspen Mountain. Um, in regards to the vegetation, I do have to give them credit and, and they really have done a great job. The weeds and the thistle for years, I, I do all my own thistle control, cut my own lawn. Um, and we've been out there with kids and we've been battling thistle for years and we've actually gone on to the property right, right across from, you know, to, to use the, the millstone. And, um, it's been, so that's been really great. Um, they have done uh, a lot of the, uh, update. It's interesting. You talk about the front of the house and the back of the house. They have done a massive job on the front of their house. I mean, I drive up there and turn the corner and it reminds me of either a West end house or Greenwich, Connecticut. I mean, there is perfect. They have planted it. They've got this huge rock sculptor in there. They've got Sky Beam Ranch with all their little lights lit up at night, which um, really sort of bothers me because be we like to turn our lights off at night and um, and uh, not draw attention to ourselves. And so it's really it's a good marketing thing, but it it's sort of obnoxious. But let me get back to to my. Um, this is my own. Um, Here's what happened when the, when the developer originally came in and, and my interaction with the original developer, which was the city. The city came to me and said, look, we've got this 30-something acre par parcel. Um, we've got the good news and the bad news. You know, um, uh, you know, the good news is we're only putting one house on it because really we could put three. But hey, so you're going to get a house, but we're going to make sure it's only one house. I guarantee it. No problem. Here I am at this point. So when they said, okay, it's going to go through, um, and by the way, I'm on a well, okay, and this is where I'm getting to my, um, to my long-term issues. I'm on a, on a good well. Historically, the West Buttermilk Shale has been problematic. It has moved. Wells have drawn up, dried up. My neighbors have had wells drawn up, dried up. Um, knock on, this isn't wood, but something. Uh, my well is good. Um, so when the, when the first house came in, when the Williams house went in, they had to provide water. This is before the Metro District. The first well, test drill, that the city um, came up dry. Second one, they drilled within 210 feet of mine. And that came up with water, not surprisingly. Uh, I had to hire out of my pocket a, a local water rights attorney to fight it and explain that, you, that there's a radius involved in, in uh, existing wells and new wells and that kind of thing. And so they uh, left that and they put a third well, and I wish I could point it to you um but if you if you go up the first first switchback and then you okay. go towards the second you have one this with with move. with the well on it there you go right here right there they came up with that well and um that came up with water and again my attorneys uh out of my pocket um I, we we did a drawdown test and it and as mitch alluded to um it, it, had, it had a big impact on my water um so uh the well was from what I understood, capped and is not able to use. Now, if you look at, if you draw a, a straight line between that well and my well, the activity envelope for this property is right on top of it. Okay, so, I, you know, I'm not a geophysicist or anything like this, but I do know the wells are dried up out there in the shale. I don't know whether this existing, um, uh, existing um, project would have any effect on the aquifer or, or whatever short term, long term. Um, Here's what I want to let you guys understand in certain terms is that the tap fees and the fees to, to, um, to, to run the ditch down and then to tap in and then pay the 
the buttermilk gallon of water, that is not within my economic <coughs> reality, okay? So this, now what I'm trying to do is protect the value of my home. And if, um, if for some reason these things shift, and who knows? I mean, this might not be a non-issue. The house goes in, aquifer stays fine, everybody's happy. Down the road, whoever buys my house or, or whatever, they can tap into the West Buttermilk. Um, but if my water dries up, and I don't know whether it's due to this project or not, but if it does, my game's over. So when you say planning and zoning will have an impact on view plane, thresholds, that kind of thing, this is a long-term potential impact that will have um, egregious effects on this neighbor. So my really concern is, I mean, I, I can see the, and, and I, I think the whole project's talk about 15 pounds in a 10 pound, I think it's 15 and about a two pound. Mm -hmm. um, and they've gerrymandered the lot. And, you know, I understand, you know, it's about Aspen's, you make money on your real estate. Um, I, I prefer to do it the, the old fashioned way. I bought it 20 years ago and I still drive in the driveway every day going, I cannot believe I live here. I really want to protect that. And that's why I'm waiting patiently to speak and, and let you guys know. Uh, the, the, the neighborhood is, is not for it, but I'm not for it because um, of, of a real um, visceral uh, impact to me and my family. So. Great, thank you very Thanks, much. That's all I have. Thank you. Anybody else wish to make public comment? Seeing none, I'm gonna close the public comment and bring it back to the board for discussion. Let me ask a question of uh, Rai uh, or John. Um, the approval on the GMQS was June 14th. Does that make it too late to call back up for reconsideration? Does it have to be the very next regular meeting or within 30 days? I Rachel, as far as an appeal goes, I was actually just trying to look at that, but um, the time frame for doing that. I don't know if it's an appeal. That's more from the other side, but generally, one can, a can board just, member who voted in the positive. Can, can I just try um, and clarify? To correct me if I'm wrong, but there is an appeal process that goes out from GSQS, G, GMQS awards, and then it has to be publicly announced. We saw it at a preview kind of effect, yeah. so that it could go out to the public for appeal. There were no appeals at that time, so it came back to the board for our nod of approval. We kind of move it along. We don't really have, we don't really have an opinion. I mean, it, it gets passed by P and Z. Well, we see it once um, as a heads up. Prior, and then it goes and, out to public appeal process. We do have an approval or an acceptance exactly. of the P and Zs, and that was on June fourteenth. So the question Rachel's asking is, can can the BLCC ask for a call up uh, to or reconsider re our, to our own vote? It would have to be at the next regular is meeting. Is it the next regular meeting? That's what I was. It would be. Thinking. I think that's the legal requirement for us to do a call up. That would be. To my understanding. June twenty eighth. That's different than the code provision, so that's. Yeah, this is a that's regular BOCC process. BOCC procedure, and it has to be someone who voted in the affirmative. Somebody who voted for it would have to call back up at the next regularly scheduled meeting. So it, that timeline has passed. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 I feel there was a little bit of confusion during that time period because your, your concerns. It, it was said, well, don't worry, we can. Um, yeah, it's up to you guys whether to approve the subdivision or not, but the GMQS is separate. And then now it's like, well, if you approve the subdivision, you're stuck with that full GMQS, not a subdivision that's subject to a smaller. Uh, but I also don't know why we couldn't put conditions on a subdivision separate from GMQS. I mean, they just might have some unused GMQS. And is that legal? So Rye's going to have to get back to us on that one yeah, as well. So my my suggestion for us now is, in in lieu of denying it flat out with these unanswered questions, that we move it forward to second reading on the 26th or whenever it's determined to come back to us with these questions answered, and that gives us the opportunity to deny it at second reading. Would that be right? 
Well, the the other option would be the other option continue. would be or to, to continue. continue. And I, I would rather continue okay. and rather move it on to first reading, frankly, till we had all these questions answered. That's probably safer. Yeah. I don't believe this gets a second reading. This is its reading with public hearing today. It says first reading, but I've never had a mistaken. first reading with a public hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So it comes back to us on the 26th, I thought. It, it does. This is a, a two-reading uh, requirement for the ordinance, for the rezoning, and then also for the subdivision. T today is the public hearing, and what that means is we noticed for it today, and that's why you, the neighbors got the notice. Yeah, so the, it's second, the, first the second meeting would be the public meeting. Yeah, so I, I, would be, I, I think it would make more sense uh, for to hear back from the attorney's office on some of these specific questions and, and ask, and then... Uh, have a continuation with the date certain. George, can I ask you a question? Uh, Certainly. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that the best answer is to continue the first reading. That way you're still in the public hearing when we come back. Um, and clearly it's necessary, so I'm not trying to push forward. I'm wondering if it's better or you prefer if I respond to any of what we just heard now or wait till we continue and do it then. I, I don't know how much more information we can. <laughs> yeah. I, I think most of the questions are for our staff and our legal department at this point. Okay. Generally, I thought you get a chance I mean, to respond to the public comment. Well, well okay, if you want to do that. But I, 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 I'm asking if you'd rather wait uh, until it continued and then I can do that then. Uh, um, or? You're welcome to respond now. Okay. Well, well I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I want, to, I want to start by explaining my clients have gone out of their way to meet with as many neighbors as they can, address concerns as they've arisen, uh, and, and in a positive fashion. Uh, and I think that's shown in the letters of support from a lot of the neighbors, including quite a few neighbors in the Aspen Oak subdivision. In addition, I feel like it's worth pointing out and somehow being overlooked that all of these lots in Aspen Oaks average about five acres per lot. And several of them have homes of the size we're proposing. This lot right here owned by Alex Dillard is a house of at least 8,250 square feet, utilized a TDR to get there. The lots that were developed by George Schifrin up on this side are bigger homes as well. Uh, this lot, I don't remember if the approval is still current or not, but had approval for a 15,000 square foot house. Um, and they all access up past here and then turn up through this way. Some of these neighbors have voiced their support. Andrew Arneman's written two letters of support. Um, Wally Obermeyer wrote a letter of support. I've spoken with Alex Dillard because he's also a client of mine. While he didn't write a letter, he has no opposition. Um, so, of course, not everyone is happy. No one ever, <laughs> never is that way. Uh, but five acre lots around here are not only typical, but quite the norm. Uh, and homes of 8250 and bigger are also quite common. Um, and we acknowledge that we're going to go through a site plan review with scenic review, and we know that it's going to have to be found to comply, or we're going to have to find a way to make it comply, whether it's sink it or shrink it or both. Um, the driveway cut we specifically looked into with civil engineer. There's a report in the application. We don't know exactly where it'll be located yet, but the civil engineer concluded that the straightaway from here to there is adequate in length. It doesn't look like it on a blown up map, but is adequate in length and provides adequate site distances to assure that safety will be addressed. Um, and it's flat through here this land, this area. Uh, so we're confident that that's not an issue for us. Concern with the trial need not be a concern because we're not building the trial. We're simply providing an easement for it 
should anyone ever want to pursue that in the future. Um, we were going to build, provide the easement and build a trail on this property. It became clear that the trail building wasn't proper, so we said we won't build it now. We'll simply allocate those funds to another planned trail that is in this area, which is what we're talking about on Buttermilk Mountain. The same funds to build $35,000 of trail across all of this property will be allocated to a trail just across the way on Buttermilk. We started this bef way before we applied to the county, which was last September. We started meeting with the West Buttermilk Metro District. Uh, we discussed capacity to serve, the ability to serve, that the property is within the district boundaries. The district issued us a letter saying that they have the capacity and will provide water. We applied with that letter. And then come our hearing December 13th, the day or two before that, the district decided we want to hold back that letter now and have more meetings and discuss this further. Okay, we did that. We took six months of delay to do that. We went and met with the Metro District. We sat down in a room with the four members of the board that were there. Uh, well, three present, one on conference call. They told us in no uncertain terms, we want to study the capacity of our system to make sure we can handle everything we know we need to handle, plus this home. And we'll get back to you. And if we have capacity, we will provide a service. We left that meeting. We waited. We waited. The study was delayed longer than we were told. Then it was delayed again. Then it was delayed again, but while it was delayed, we were told the study was already completed and showed you we do have the capacity, but we have some board members that aren't, don't want to vote on it yet. They decided, yeah, of course my client at that point said, come on already, we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for six months uh, for an answer on this when you already told us if you have the capacity, you'll provide water. So they decided, uh, so he wrote a letter saying, please make a decision. <laughs> you know, enough's enough. So they generated, they, they did what they do. Uh, we weren't involved there, but uh, apparently they held a vote uh, and then generated a new letter saying we still have capacity and we're still committed to serve this property if the subdivision's approved. So that's clearly changed since the whole conservation easement and everything that back then the Metro District did not have City of Aspen water but was relying on a series of wells. Now they're on city water. That's another change condition that supports what we're proposing to do. Um, it's unfortunate that the city made lots of representations and didn't follow through properly, but it's not rocket science to put something in the warranty deed that says no subdivision. I'm not a lawyer, but I could have done that. They didn't do it. <laughs> they didn't do it. Three, four property owners later, many title commitments later, many title policies later, without it ever being an issue or ever coming up or being in anyone's awareness because of that, we're still rehashing it even though the court said that issue is all over and shouldn't be brought up or held against this property ever again. So uh, we're doing the right thing. We're putting all of the va valued open space, all of the habitat in the conservation easement. And we're proposing the home in an area that's not habitat and is in an area that's surrounded by single family homes of the same nature that we're proposing. Um, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I've tried over the whole course of this review process to talk with Julian and you know we, we talk but not really about <laughs> this issue so much I don't know what to say about the well other than we've done everything we can to protect his water by saying we won't use that well we won't even use it for irrigation which we could uh, and that we'll cap it and turn the water rights back over um, I don't know how we're going to affect the aquifer when we're then going to be connected to city of Aspen water via the metro district um, but 
we're doing everything we can to make sure we don't have any negative effect on Julian's water supply uh, because we do care about that. I think, you know, the, my, my clients are out here. I've seen them plenty of times on this property. Uh, maybe they're just quiet, and that's a good thing for neighbors sometimes. But uh, I think that's really all I wanted to address is, you know, we're trying to do the right things, and we are compatible with the neighborhood. We are consistent with the development patterns in the area, both in terms of lot size and house size. Um, and if that house size doesn't fit in scenic review, then we're going to have to find a way to adjust. And we know that. And I've acknowledged that on the record umpteen times. All right. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, so with that, I would accept a motion to continue for a date certain. I'll make a motion to continue. And should we continue to the date certain of July 26th? Do you think that gives us enough time? We can do that. Uh, I can't guarantee that we'll have everything ready for that I'd meeting. So we might have to continue. The continuance. Again. And, and, and this then, motion is for both of the two resolutions or just one I'm at just a time? I'm just making it for all of it. The, the resolution. We'll them before us today. Okay. The ordinance and the resolution. And I have a question, though. Do we have do you want any further clarification for the county attorney or staff, or are we good to go? I think I know what you're asking. But you know where to find us? Yes. Okay, perfect. So that's my motion. I'll second. Thank further you. discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate that. So that concludes our regular agenda items. We are, have open discussion. Do we have anything for open discussion today, John? Yeah, just a, a real quick item. We had scheduled for October 18th a meeting uh, with the uh, town of Carbondale uh, with open space and trails. Uh, they um, had a, a scheduling issue, and they're suggesting the 17th, which is a Tuesday. Um, obviously, that's way in advance in terms of our um, yeah, and we will have presented the first reading of the proposed budget the Tuesday before, so we think that that should be a pretty We're going down there too, right? flexible uh, meeting. So we just wanted to get that on your radar screens, even though it's early, just to make sure that there were no other conflicts with the board. If, if On the 17th? Uh, yeah, on October yeah, it 17th. Work for me that day anyway. Yeah. So that would probably be a sort of a four o'clock meeting, end of the day meeting with them, a joint meeting. Yes, I it, it was in the afternoon. I don't have the exact time. Uh, you may uh, just we may think about, about late afternoon, uh, yeah. sort of a, a, a pizza. Yeah. Okay. Something. And typically, with the joint, they're they're meeting in the evenings anyway as a council. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. That's it. Anybody else have anything for open discussion? No. Seeing none, I would accept the motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Grassroots. Thank you. 17th. 17th, yeah.